We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Mantry and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. I didn't think of an intro. I, we were like dealing stuff with behind uh, behind the scenes and Tom's going to be like going off to get a timer it's, and cooking food in the background. It's summer in so. Canada. It's what? Canada? It's summer in Canada in oh, Florida. Oh, yeah. That sounds about <laughs> right. Although It's like mid-60s. It's beautiful, <laughs> Rob. It's beautiful. That I can handle. Mid-60s. I've got the I doors open, the windows open. It's yes. not too humid. It is beautiful gotcha. oh my god all, you know all the floridians are like i went cycling with people yesterday it was 65 degrees which i don't know you have to look it up or whatever the yeah, hell yeah, it yeah. is in, in celsius but it was 65 <laughs> degrees which is very i swear to you dog i will you will be glue do they make glue out of dogs felix cut it out <laughs> so the doors are open the windows are open the okay. dogs are going kind of nuts yes i got apparent. no choice here so either I can put them in their crates. I, I don't care. Stop yeah, staring at probably me. Probably going to have to. We're going to have a little bit of some little drama here. And don't worry. My son's going to come home and <laughs> randomly make food behind That's right, me. yeah. So every, we're going to have a lot of that. Every week without Tom's camera, it just, it just gets a little bit more chaotic gets, in the background. Well, it's not the camera. Because they used to come home and the, the dogs and everything would be fine. It was fine. But then uh, I had my own room I you could had go a room into. But I can't go going, into yes, my yeah. room because it's it, the home theater is That's totally right. trash. Yeah. Which I am trying to get moving forward with this yes. thing, and I, but I can't. We're starting anyways. a recording a little bit later than usual because we thought a plumber was coming, but then he, I don't know if he canceled or if it was left mm. open or just got pulled I, away you know, to something people else. People like to complain about plumbers, and I don't blame you for wanting to complain about plumbers. Felix, leave it. <laughs> Good God. Jesus, dog. Oh, get a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> he just When he decides it's time to... P L A Y. I can't say it out loud because it'll get all stupid. Oh right. Okay. Um, I swear it's like having toddlers in here. It again. is. It very uh, much is. He's like relentless. He's, he'll mm. just keep bugging her. He'll just paw at her, and she's little. She's twenty five pounds. He's eighty something. I don't yeah. know. Seventy. High dog, little 80s. dog. Yes. So, anyways, uh, yeah. I don't. I, people like to give plumbers a hard time because you know they're always late and blah blah blah. The plants <laughs> repair people too are the same sort of thing. But the, the reality is. First of all, apparently nobody knows how to use like Google anticipate what how long it takes you to mm. get to a place. Sure. Right? Cuz you can go into Google Maps on your PC at least. Yeah. Uh, or your your Chrome or Windows yeah. or whatever. On your phone, and works you can in the app. you can tell it what time you're going to go. Yes. Or what time you want to be there and what's the estimated time based yeah. on that. And people are just still like you know, well, I looked it up at 3 a.m. and it says it's going to take me half an hour to get there. Yeah, yeah. at 3 a.m. it does. It Guess is what? basing at 3 its PM. predictions on actually, I mean, predominantly current traffic of who else yes. has the Google Maps app open right now while they're driving in the background right. of their phone. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, so there's part of that. So I blame them for that part. But mm -hmm. most of the part is that they... Um, uh, you know, they go to a job that and the, and the people tell them, oh, I might, I got a clog. Can you come plunge it for me? And they come mm -hmm. there and the like toilet is exploded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're like. Or pipe okay, burst this is a, inside of the wall. A little bit more a of a much repair. bigger job than we yeah. thought it was going to be. So I don't blame them for that. But yes, we called them. They were supposed to be here between you know 8 and 10 a.m. We usually record this podcast starting at 10 a.m. my time. Yeah. And uh, at 10, 15, we called them and they were like, oh, he's still, you know, all in a different town. Okay. I'm like, okay, well. Well, yeah, I mean, if they're working on another job, I can I yeah. can understand that absolutely. absolutely. And I mean, Tom, why, why on earth would anyone else in Florida need a plumber right now? It's only <sighs> you. You're the only one. I can't imagine another situation. Yeah. I can't. Who, I did meet a guy. Who I didn't meet him. could it be? There was a guy who came into the shop the other day and he um, was getting his bike fixed because it got flooded with water. Mm. But um, because he lives in my neighborhood mm -hmm. and... Uh, his house burnt down Ooh. after the flooding yeah. because they were running fans to try to dry oh, out see. everything. And, and there was an electrical spark electrical or something? Electrical spark, and it burned the house down. So <sighs> flood, and then your house burns down. Uh -huh. You know, 
I mean, honestly, that's, even if it went the other day. direction, it wouldn't be any better. <laughs> it's still a problem. If it burned way. down first and then flooded, it would put the fire out, but that would still be horrible. It is still bad. Yeah. All right, Rob. Let's. I. I and I. I am not laughing at this person. No, no, gosh, no, them. no. We're but laughing is, because what else are you going to do? Cry on the what podcast? Else you do? That's so I wasn't. <laughs> not, I was not in the shop when the guy came in with his bike to get his bike fixed because mm-hmm. it had gotten flooded. And the owner looked at him and went, "Well." At least your bike's okay. <laughs> ah. What else are you going to say? What else are you going to say? Yeah. So anyways, what did you watch, Rob? Yeah, so I mean, I wanted to mention uh, NHL hockey. We're into the actual regular season now. There's a mosquito in this room, so I'm going to try and swat it at some oh, point. Oh, good. More uh, bu- more animals. <laughs> that's right. But we're into the into the regular season now. Uh, and uh, uh, Vancouver Canucks, whom, of course, I, I, I cheer for, uh, start off, won their first two games. So that's like the best start they've had in seven years. And, uh, you know, fair weather fans, we're going all the way to the cup because of two games. And that's uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but yes, anyway, getting aside oh from that. Oh, my God. Can I, can I just tell you right now? Can I just say something because you made me yes. think of it? Okay. I am so sick of people using the word real as if as an exclusionary term Mm -hmm. you know like you're not a real fan because you haven't been here through the 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 bad years or whatever it's like who cares or did they buy a ticket Ah. yes okay then (laughs) they are supporting the team let them be let them be fake fans with lots of money (laughs) all right who cares if taylor if people are buying jerseys because taylor swift Ah, is at the stupid game that is in the news yes oh my god people getting so mad about taylor swift distracting from the game that's right I, I t- let me tell you how many Kansas City Chiefs g- games I have watched in my life. <laughs> One, mm-hmm. and it was it was not it was mostly because my wife and I are bored of watching YouTube right now. And she said, "Try to fight the live sports." And I went on Thursday. It was Thursday night, and Amazon Prime Videos got Thursday yep. night football, and they it was sure Chiefs do. playing, and we played it. But I would not have started that game if I had not if I looked at it and gone, "Oh, it's just the Chiefs," and I don't really care okay. about any of these teams. But then I went, "Oh yeah, Taylor Swift," and then we turned on <laughs> and boop. Taylor Swift popped up. <laughs> oh, what, dear. I mean, everything about that situation is good for your team. And, and you're going to be like, well, they're not real. They're not real fans. Who cares? <laughs> oh, my God. Why do we have to exclude everybody from everything? Same <laughs> thing with AV, right? Yeah. Why can't, oh, you don't have. Those are Bose speakers. Those aren't real speakers. <laughs> hey, man, they got speakers. Why don't you give them a, a little bit? All right. Give them just, just just let them have that. Let's give them some props. For having speakers, that's like a massive step up above most other. It's people. a it's a large step. That first step is the largest. There's no question yeah. about it. Yes, but no, we got to exclude everybody from everything. So yes, you're fair weather fans. Go Rob. Oh well, Be we're famously in Vancouver. We're we're pretty much all fair weather fans when it comes to our sports teams. As soon as they win a game, we're like, ah, oh, yeah, yay, we loved them all along. And as soon as they lose one game, we're like, ah, oh, they're the worst. We're never going anywhere. It's all well, you just big city fire big everybody city people. Yes, nobody absolutely. likes nobody likes the big city people. <laughs> But uh, yeah, moving on from that. Uh, so keeping up with Loki season two. Uh, there's only been two episodes at the time that we're recording this. Uh, definitely a a, a big time uh, slowdown in the second episode from the first episode yeah, that I loved so usually. much. Completely yeah. different tone. Uh, still very good, uh, but but a completely different tone. So they're they're taking very different tones from episode to episode. I did enjoy that. You know, like the the version of Loki that's in the Loki show is not the same Loki that we watched in like Endgame and Infinity War because it's the Loki that escaped during the first Avengers movie when they went back in time. So he's still got some evil in him. And I liked that a little bit of the evil came out in this second episode. That's because good. Because he, I kind of yeah. felt like they were trying to like, he Fully watched that video. Him, yeah. <laughs> he, he watched that video of his life and then like learned all those life lessons from watching that video. I'm like, yeah. ah, I don't know. Yeah, they were trying to like equal up the two versions yeah. of Loki, but uh, yeah. So anyway, I like that. Uh, you know, Star Trek Lower Decks. Uh, I caught up on that. I hadn't been watching it since the very beginning that it started airing. It's fourth season that they're in now. Still very, very funny. Still exceedingly rapid. Because oh man, do they? It's just like I can, I can only see the voice director's instructions to everyone who uh, uh, voice acts on that show. I think they just have one note, which is faster, because uh, <laughs> they go really, really rapidly. But now that they're into season four and trying to progress the characters a little bit um in the background with all the easter eggs and everything the first few seasons were very much predominantly 
the next generation easter eggs it was uh, mostly references to the next generation the background easter eggs were mostly the next generation and that is certainly the series that i watched the most of when it comes to star trek uh, and knew the best so i was catching most i think of the of the easter eggs and references but now they're very much moving on to deep space nine and voyager references and i did not voyager want... i would get i've seen every single episode okay of voyager. i never saw I every episode of voyager the... i saw every episode yeah. of deep space nine but i pretty much only once there's only a few that i yeah, saw me too. more yeah, than yeah, once yeah. whereas next generation i saw a lot of those episodes multiple times mm -hmm. um so yeah th Reruns, now it's baby. now now i'm starting to get a feel for like oh if you were only tacitly uh familiar yeah. with the next generation this is how it would have felt <laughs> so i'm starting to get that but i uh, very much enjoying that show still very very funny still really well written but what i want to talk about most is uh, the movie pearl uh pearl is technically the sequel to x uh but it's right. uh, it's a prequel it's it's right. set um i think 60 years before uh x uh, so still starring Mia Goth. Uh, I believe she gets a co-written uh, credit on this one as well. And you could basically call this movie, uh, Mia Goth says to everyone, hey, everyone, come watch me act my ass off. Because <laughs> that is what that this movie is. Uh, I loved this movie. I absolutely loved Pearl. Um, but it is 100% about being a... a, a uh, standout performance from Mia Goth. There is one scene where I don't know if I've seen a longer single take uh, where I mean, they didn't even move the camera. This isn't even like a slow zoom in or slowly dollying the camera or anything like that. They just sat the camera on a tripod, aimed it at her face for I don't know how many minutes solid, and she just acted her face off for that entire time no cuts no camera movement nothing uh in fact while she was going through this tremendously long monologue i was kind of thinking like are, are they gonna she was talking to someone during the monologue i'm like are they gonna cut to their cut face to the for any sort of reaction yeah. it was like nope it's just gonna be i think it was it had to have at least been five minutes it felt like eight or ten minutes but of course in movie time it was almost certainly right. shorter than that uh but i don't know if i've ever seen a longer single take um in, in a in a movie so uh absolutely amazing amazing there yeah i i can't recommend this highly enough it's ostensibly in the horror genre but similar to x uh it, it's not i mean there's definitely some gore and that but that's not what the movie is about it's not a slasher movie um and again the the main emotion i felt while watching this was sadness as opposed to uh outright fear or or dread or something like that um but just fantastic performances. Uh, uh, Mia Goth's character, her mother, is another predominant character in this movie. And I, I didn't actually look up that uh, actor's name, but her performance really, really got me. So, uh, yeah, okay. can't recommend it highly enough. I mean, it's not happy. <laughs> Don't watch this movie if you want to be, like, laughing and having a good time. And it's not, like, action-packed. Uh, it's, it's just about watching these actors do their thing, and I loved it. So Pearl is highly, highly, highly recommended by me. All right. So what have I watched? Not much, as you would imagine. No. Um, uh, we are, I'm right at the end of Star Wars Rebels Season 3. Okay. I'm going with the last episode, I think, because it's part two of something. Yeah. And then the fourth season is shorter, so you're almost done. Yeah, almost done. Uh, and like Rob said, about halfway through the Season 3, they were like, you can see where Dave Filoni, is that his name, Filoni? Yep. yep. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, decided that... Um, we should start exploring the empire a little bit more mm -hmm. and getting a little bit. So those of you that don't know and uh, have not been around the Star Wars universe that much, uh, there is a character named Thrawn who was in, right. developed by uh, Timothy Zahn in the, the, like the, the books that were written. I can't remember the name of the series. Yeah, novels, uh, uh, Heir to the Empire. Heir to the Empire, yeah. that's right. Right after, it's kind of like right, it's supposed to be like Luke's kids and stuff, or I yeah. think, or Leia's kids, I can't remember. Anyways, it doesn't matter. The, the reality is, is Thrawn was like by far the standout character sure. of those books. I mean, and he kind of took the place him. of the Emperor and Vader. He was, he was he the did. new evil. He was the new big bad, mm -hmm. but he was not like, I'm controlled by space magic or mm -hmm. that I control space magic. He was like, I'm just super duper smart. Yeah. And you're starting to see that in, uh, he comes in, he, 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 you can see him on the poster. He's the blue dude. Yeah. So, I mean, he's he's all over the place. And you also see a mall in there, which was an interesting <laughs> character arc for him. I did like the way they ended it with okay. him. I was, uh, I can understand if people didn't. Oh, yes. But I... 
I did like the way they ended it with Maul. I was like, this is a long pause. Why is this pause so long? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the action started, and I was like, oh. Yeah. Well, that makes sense, actually. <laughs> I kind of, kind of tracks. And I kind of like how you can take the one-sentence description of what happened to Darth Maul, and you can take it from going back to the prequels, and then you can take it to the ending in Rebels, and you can be like, oh, still works. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So I very Some much tidy, liked, uh, tidying up writing going on there. You can kind of see how this thing is 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 as Dave Filoni as a writer, as a producer, or you know, showrunner or whatever you call him for this, um, seems to be moving more towards this darker, like Rob said, darker, but yep. also uh, exploring the universe in a more realistic way you know the the movies don't have time really to mm -hmm. delve in that's the whole at least for me that's the whole point of the tv series is that you can really get into the nuance of the the world building and stuff whereas with movies there's world building but it's it's like broad strokes and there's only so much you can do so i uh i am very I, i'm enjoying this more than i thought i didn't like i didn't love the first yep season and yep. maybe I, I don't really like Ezra all that much yep. who's like the main character I'm like <laughs> I'm like if he accidentally fell off a fell off a space, space lock I'd be okay with that and the fact that I know from Ahsoka <laughs> that there is something that kind of happens to him I'm not sure exactly what it is yet I'm I know something happens it kind of gives me like if I didn't know that I might not I might stop watching the series just because I was like I can't take this kid anymore man he's freaking killing me and he is the main character absolutely without he is question, the, main he's character. the main character but you know like in the real world when you keep backstabbing your friends constantly and and doing things that they explicitly warn you against and mm -hmm. then getting everybody in trouble and they mm -hmm. have to come save you that doesn't happen a lot that happens like once maybe twice and they're like you know what kid I'm sorry you're out. But you they're just, a family, not, Tom, and they rag on each other and they hey, bust I, each other's chops. It's all in I, good fun. I, I, I love how they, they use this word family as if it, it forgives all sins. There's yep. lots of families that do not speak to each other anymore, <laughs> and this kid would be one of them. So I I, I think it's a I think it's it, it's definitely worth the watch. It's better than I thought it was. I'll tell you when they put in what's her name? Uh Moth Moth the the lady. <laughs> Who's the leader of the rebellion? Oh, Mon Mothma? Basically, Mon Mothma. Yes. yes. When they put her in there, her character, her her physical character, the yep. anime character, looks like one of the puppets off of Mister Rogers. Okay. It's driving me absolutely <laughs> bonkers. I cannot stand. Yeah, it's it. a highly stylized animation that they went for. The so. rest of the animation's not bothering me all no. that much. Not that much. And but like that said, the, character the walked on. I was like, geez. The ships Gus, and the space battles look great. The stormtroopers yes. look great. Yes. The, the droids look great. It's the people don't look like people. <laughs> Darth Vader looks a little stretched out. I'm going to yes, be honest yeah. with you. He does they look a little, a a little narrow. Um, I did. Uh, it's 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 the Halloween season. So I, I started uh, scary stories to tell in the dark or something. Okay. Like That's a movie. It's a PG-13 horror movie. I was like, ah. hey, it's Friday, Friday or Saturday night or whatever it was. And we're going to, you know, we're we're all home. Me and my, my wife and my uh my 14-year-old son, my 17-year-old son was at homecoming, so we was like, let's watch a scary movie. We watched a scary movie together. It'll be kind of fun. We sat down. Uh, my son was jumping around. I mean, we, we didn't get 10 minutes into the stupid okay. movie. My son was jumping around so much, I was like, dude, I am... You gotta stop. You gotta sit still. And, and my where, wife kept... Where physically were you watching this? On the So we're in the home theater, but on my computer. Right. <laughs> like on my center channel, which is in the middle of the room. Wow. Yeah, you know, with a... It's just really bad. Mm. Anyways, so he's jumping around like an idiot, driving me nuts. My wife keeps getting up and leaving the room to go do something. And then while she's in the room, she's checking her phone. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Am I in the movie theater right now? It's the Am I in the movie, movie theater? Watching experience. It's exactly what movie watching experience is. I, I turned it off, and everybody's like, "Why are you turn it off for?" I'm like, "I'm watching it by myself. Right. You people aren't invited in here anymore, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned." So yeah, I started it. I will finish it. I like the opening scenes. Okay. I mean, they were very stylized and very, um, let's say, 70s, 80s period, period mm -hmm. accurate. So if you're into like uh, Stranger Things and stuff, this the, you'll recognize the the genre, if you will. And uh, whether I like it or not, I am rewatching old episodes of Star uh, Star Trek: The Original Series because okay. my my dad got it for. Or my mom got it for my dad, or something mm -hmm. for Christmas or his birthday or something, and he got, like the the DVDs or the yep. Blu-rays. I'm not sure which, and uh, they have the original plus they have the 
enhanced ones. Then it might be the, the Blu-ray. Yeah, because the Blu-ray yeah. is when they completely remastered everything from the original negatives. Looks fantastic. Yeah, and so we're uh, we're uh, I'm going every once in a while I go over there and they're always watching one. So yeah. last night I was I was watching one with them. It does look really good. Yeah. I mean it. At some point, I have to watch the animated <laughs> it looks, series. It looks really good in the way that you can make very low budget sci fi. Oh, well, like this. No, I just that, mean that the, the quality good. of the image. Like, yes. there's no, they cleaned up any dust scratches, whatever. It's, it's super clear, and it was all shot on film. So, yeah, yeah. it looks fantastic. But yeah, some, at some point, I have to watch the animated series because that really is Star Trek season four. They have all the original cast there doing the voices uh but i've really? never watched the animated series so i i i remember there i remember seeing some episodes of that yeah like before school and i remember not i mean i don't remember loving it but i, I yeah. was young and i don't really whatever. and but last go ahead. last thing before we uh leave what we watched uh as we're recording this barbie comes out on disc today so are you going to get it Tom? <laughs> You gotta oh, watch I didn't that. order it. I've I got. Order it. I've got to get your opinion on that. You've been waiting. Well, avoiding I'm not going to watch spoilers. it until I get my home theater back. Oh so no, it's going to yeah, be such that's... a long wait. When am I supposed to watch it on? I my know. computer doesn't have a disc drive. Do you have anybody <laughs> around who's got at least a big TV? You can go watch it at their place. Um, yeah. No. <laughs> get over to Clint's place. He's got a projector. Yeah. No. <laughs> All right, this is AV Rent, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask us by emailing us at question at avrent.com. You go to mm-hmm. our website, find our episodes, our show notes, and our Flickr albums where you can follow along with the pictures that we talk about in this episode. I uh, can contact, oh, no, let me see here, uh, facebook.com slash podcast, youtube.com slash avrent, where you can see our live recording sessions. Those mm-hmm. images will also be in, integrated into there. My, my picture won't be there any, until... Tom's still a logo. I'm a logo. Yes. Uh, contact us directly, Rob at avrent.com. You can look on whatever social media you're on. Uh, at First Reflect will be him. Yep. Unless he's not there, in which case. Find me on threads. Else. Come on over the threads, people. The water's fine. I'm not going to. I know. I'm apparently not invited <laughs> to threads. I'm not allowed. <laughs> Tom at avrant.com, where your email can sit in my email box for weeks on end before Sounds I right. get a chance to go look at it. So I want to thank our listeners of the week to become a listener of the week, support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, where you can send us a PayPal donation. We want to send, thank Tyler for doing that this week. Thank you very much, Tyler. Yes, indeed, Tyler. Thank you for the PayPal donation. You can do that on our website, avrant.com, over on the right-hand side where it says support AV Rant. So thank you very much for the financial support. Yes. If you want to support us monthly, you mm-hmm. can do that by, by PayPal, but more importantly, you can also do it by uh, Patreon, patreon.com slash podcast will take you to our page where you can sign up to become a, a monthly subscriber to our podcast. Every month they'll take some money from you, a minimum of a dollar, and give most of it to us. So right now we have 136 patrons, and we want to thank every single one of you. Thank you very much. That is right, patreon.com slash podcast just like Tom said. So a big thanks to our 136 patrons over there. Last week I asked uh, Chris if I could have permission to use his photos on avgadgets.com where I'm the editor-in-chief. And he said yes and also sent me some more photos. So thank you very much, yeah. Chris, for that. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I'm glad we know he's listening. There's no question he was listening because that's the only place we said such things. So uh, thank you very much, Chris, for listening and for the support and the permission. We also got notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going through the world mostly burning down around us uh, from uh, Dan, who enjoyed our dream system cho- equipment choices and thoughts on putting together cost no objects home theaters. Chris, who thinks both of us for our uh, all the time and effort we put into the show mike who says a thousand blessings for all the knowledge and entertainment luke loves our work and the advice we share stan greg who says we make his work commutes more enjoyable and he's listened to every episode from tip to tail and yet he has somehow never figured out our secret words to prove he's a member of the two hour plus club what are they how did he miss them well, and I'm not going to call you a liar, sir. Or you, you might have fallen asleep, but I mean, they were there. The secret was we said them after the outro music. So if yes. you got to the outro music and were like, oh, that's the end of the podcast and turn it off, which I couldn't possibly blame you, but you would have had to listen all the way through the outro music and then uh, gotten the secret ending at the end there, the tag, right. which we don't usually do, but we don't we've do that done it like often, thrice. 
<laughs> we used to do it quite often, but we don't do it anymore. Right. Uh, Julian, who still learns something new from us every week. Michael, who loved our feedback about pairing his HSU VTF3 Mark V subwoofer with a different second sub in his new room. And he now intends to go with an SVS PC2000 Pro cylinder. Woo-hoo! Welcome to the Cylinder Club. They're the yes. best. And Ilongo, who says, after hearing my praise of the Synaptics SE1 F headphones, he found them. I found a guy selling a pair that he got as a present, but didn't want, so he picked them up for 120 Canadian. He's very impressed with them. He had the RBH HP1B Audio Technica ATH M50X and the Sennheiser HD 5. 98SE, all based on recommendations. When he's in his office, he knows from experience that he wants open back headphones, and the Synaptic SE ones are indeed the most open back headphones ever. <laughs> no problem hearing his wife or kids calling him from downstairs, so that's a plus in his case. So thanks for the recommendation. You're welcome to Longo and all the rest of you. So let's go through it again. Dan, Chris, Mike, Luke, Stan, Greg, Julian, Jul- Michael, and the Longo. Thank you for thanking us. And I'll say the names one more time, so they came from my lips. Dan, Chris, Mike, Luke, Stan, Greg, Julian, Michael. Michael, one of us, one of us. And Ilongo, thank you all very much for your notes of gratitude and encouragement. We very much appreciate it. And a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. You know, it's kind of that thing where people like muscle cars because mm-hmm. they, when, they, when, when they were young, the, the cool cars were these, these you know, throaty, you know, Challengers, Chargers, uh, Camaros, Trans Ams, and Mustangs, right? So they, they spent their whole life wanting muscle cars and loving muscle cars and loving that look and sound and everything else. Mm-hmm. That's us in cylinders. When we were first getting into <laughs> subwoofers, SVS came out with cylinder subs and we were all like, oh, I mean, HSU cylinders. did it first. HSU was where I first yeah, saw, saw the cylinder subs and they were like the, the passive cylinders with the separate amplifier mm-hmm. that came mm-hmm. along with them. I didn't, I never owned those, but that, that was the first time I saw cylinder subs. But I think that's just indelibly, indelibly, I just drink. Indelibly. That's it. My tongue is a little frozen. Um, uh, etched in our brains as mm-hmm. being like the cool thing. And we can't get past it. I'm never going to get past it. I'm always going to think that cylinder stuff. What was just like, cool. wait, I can get all that internal volume without it being a, a two foot by three foot by four foot box? I didn't Makes care sense. about that. All I cared about the fact was that it was so unique looking that I was like, that is just too cool for me not to. So the fact that somebody else might not think so is fine. I got mm-hmm. no problems with it. You're just wrong. All right. In the news. No sooner had we finished recording our episode last week and Sony officially announced their new PlayStation 5 console redesigns. Mm-hmm. Redesigned a thing that hasn't... Oh, no. It has. Yes, there is console. I'm, I was thinking sexist. All right. <laughs> they are 30% smaller and 18 to 24% lighter. Weird. Well, it, the, but... the disc model is 18% lighter. The digital-only version is 24% lighter. It's kind of hard to call them PS5 Slims. They're still pretty darn big and keep the same overall look and shape. They'll start shipping in November or replace the original PS5 designs worldwide. Worldwide, The disc model remains at the same price, $500 in the U.S., but the digital edition with no disc drive actually goes up in price. Mm-hmm. It's now $450 U.S. dollars. Well, the original was $400. But there is a big difference. The disk drive is now fully modular and removable. You can take the disk drive off the $500 disk model and you can add a disk drive to the 450 digital edition. Buying the disk drive separately will cost 80 bucks though. But this does mean that if your disk drive ever fails, it's much easier to fix as you can simply swap in a new disk drive unit. This is unusual. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> this feels somehow like it accidentally came from an alternate reality like oh. like like that's not how these companies usually operate they make mm. things harder to repair not easier but that's interesting yep so rather than two removable side panels there are now four with the removable disk drive having one of them so you can switch between the extra bulge or not uh, there's still an uh, SSD or, uh, expansion bay hidden behind one of the other removable side panels. And the bu- built-in storage space has been increased from 825 gigs to 1 terabyte. Oh, 175 gigs. Mm-hmm. Uh, the two USB ports, ports on the front of the consoles are now uh, USB-C rather than one USB-C and one USB-A like the original versions. However, only one of the USB-C ports is high bandwidth. So if you're plugging in a PSVR 2 headset, you need to be careful that you plug it into the correct port. Only one of them works uh, for VR. And then yeah. there's the other add-on cost, which is a stand for positioning the consoles vertically, is now a $30 option that you have to buy separately. There's a... 
hilariously small plastic foot that you can flip down to position the consoles horizontal. It looks precarious, according to Rob. I haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah, it's the tiniest possible plastic foot that you could attach to have the thing lie horizontal. Don't have it near an AC vent. <laughs> it is the absolute minimum they could have done. <laughs> There's no ga- change whatsoever to gaming performance. It's all about increasing efficiency on the manufacturing side, and no doubt it helps that all the PS5 quote unquote slim consoles are actually the same now, and you're simply choosing whether to get it with a separate disk drive already attached or not. So that's whatever. I don't care. I, yep. I honestly don't care. Well, I mean, it was the uh, it was the rumor. I was very certain that these would come out. We talked about it last week, in fact, and then it's like right a- right after we finished recording, the official announcement was actually made. So all confirmed. Um, yeah, the the digital only version going up to four hundred fifty dollars, and then. If you decide you want to add the disk drive on later, it being $80. So that means if you just spend $500 right out, you're saving 30 bucks uh, and having the disk drive there. Uh, so, yeah, it's a. I don't know if that's surprising. I don't, it seems a little bit weird that the price went up. It would be kind of cool if they had kept the digital version at 400 and the disk version came at 450 or even 480 Just, you know, go exactly, but make the price a little bit lower. But whatever. Uh, I don't love that the vertical stand, which is like almost clearly the way that you're supposed to <laughs> have this console. You don't get that vertical stand in the box anymore, a $30 add-on just for that. So that's uh, definitely getting into nickel and diming territory, in my opinion. But of course, there will be third-party stands and third-party covers for those four side panels that you can replace now. So you can have some fun with that and customize it. Very exciting. <laughs> Best Buy has confirmed that starting in early 2024, they would no longer sell DVDs or Blu-rays, either in stores or online. They'll still sell video game discs, but when it comes to physical media for movies and TV shows, they're out. Yep. Best Buy will continue to sell discs through this holiday season, but a spokesperson stated that the way we watch movies and TV shows is much different today than it was dec- decades ago. Making this change gives us more space and opportunity to bring customers new and innovative tech for them to explore, discover, and enjoy. Honestly... I agree. I know people are mad about it, mm. but I agree. I think that um, it irritates me too because I used to impulse buy at Target all the time mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. I would go there, and I would see a disc that was like twenty bucks or yeah. fifteen dollars or something like that. I'd be like, "Ooh, I, I, I've all, you know, I like that movie. I don't mind spending you know fifteen, twenty dollars on it or ten dollars. Sometimes they were even less." Uh, but I, I don't like not having the option of doing that impulse buying. But mm. dude. I totally understand. Those no one's buying discs from I I can understand. Anymore. I mean, discs were pretty much always a loss leader for retail yeah. stores. Yeah. Um there there was virtually no margin uh for the store itself uh in carrying those discs. So, uh business-wise, I can understand it. It's not like I blame them or or like how could they possibly come to this decision? No, I mean it it does make sense just on the face of it. That said, as a physical media fan, it's not so much Best Buy in particular that I'm worried about. There are still, I mean, there's Amazon, there's Walmart, there's Target in the States, there's other stores in other countries that are still carrying and selling discs, if not in stores with a good selection, then online, um, that they're selling them that way. But there is no denying that Best Buy, like when they went to the disc distributors, they're a big partner they're they're a big customer of the disc distribution and having all of that just disappear uh and i mean it's not like it's being replaced by someone some other retailer that's equally as large as best buy that that just means the industry for physical discs as a whole as a whole unquestionably just shrunk with this announcement um and and that I can only imagine would lead to increased per unit prices on the discs that still remain and puts like the downward pressure on i mean are are they going to are the studios going to keep releasing discs the margin there shrinks even further when one of their largest retail partners is just bowing out so um it it isn't promising for the physical media (laughs) industry moving forward i i don't see any way to look at this and say it's it's a positive spin somehow um i can only imagine as as a physical disc fan that there that this will lead to increased prices and uh, eventually just total disappearance which i'm not happy with mainly it's not like in a vacuum that i'm unhappy about it it's that we're seeing the way streaming is going and i'm not happy that there isn't going to be an alternative uh, alternative for some form of permanence um i was really 
quite happy when Disney Plus was first announced and when they were all gung ho about it and they were saying, look, anything we put on Disney Plus is going to be there. We're not going to mess around with pulling stuff off the service and doing the Disney Vault stuff anymore. It's like, if it's on there, it's on there forever. And all of our movies that go to theaters are going to show up on this streaming service like within three months. And it was very consumer friendly in the beginning. And now it's a total about face on all of that. Now there's stuff disappearing off the service altogether. There's the random changes that they make or the censorship that they do and you can't get back to the original version and there's stuff that just isn't appearing on the service whatsoever uh and it's like because of that then i'm really scared for not having a physical media alternative um but i mean that was disappearing anyway right there was plenty of movies that weren't coming out on ultra hd blu-ray for sure plenty of movies that weren't coming out on blu-ray uh that you could usually find it on dvd down in standard definition quality but even some of that wasn't showing up anymore so overall i don't like the way things are headed it feels very consumer unfriendly to not have any f- sort of feeling of permanence that we can hold on to i i don't enjoy that so hopefully it'll come back around in some way but i can i can understand where best buy is coming from in this decision yeah so i agree with what you're saying as well i've still got a vhs copy of the original trilogy of star yeah. uh, star wars yeah. um that is the the theatrical release um, that yeah. hasn't been remastered in any, any way. And I keep it around, not that I have a VHS player anywhere. Right. I keep it around because it's literally it. That's, yeah, that's, I mean, I, I mean I, there, are, there are the people who you will have to pry the Laserdisc versions from their cold, yes. dead hands because that was the best version of the actual theatrical releases of the original Star Wars trilogy that was, there ever was. I still have the DVDs of the special edition release where they had the bonus disc that had the theatrical versions in non-anamorphic so it came up in a four by three window with letter boxes above and below and you had to use (laughs) zoom to bring it in so that was starting at like lower than 480p because it was a scan of the laser discs put into non-anamorphic on dvd so you're getting like lower than 240p quality by the time you <laughs> zoomed it in and trying to like upscale that on a on a large screen 4k display or a projector is definitely a losing battle but i still have those dvds because it's the only way i can watch the original <laughs> versions on a, any sort of any sort of official release there are the the downloaded ones out there and the the remastered you know fan edit versions but yeah that's an example that's an example for sure and i mean <laughs> the, that poor original trilogy that you get on disney plus now what a <laughs> What a chopped up mess that is at this point. <laughs> yeah, I um, I, I I have some DVDs of that too. I wonder what versions they are because mm-hmm. I I thought I got the theatrical because they it came out on DVD too, right? The theatrical release or the well, that's what it said. The only one that came out on DVD was was that bonus disc in the non anamorphic, the the actual original theatrical. Yeah, I might not have that. I might have the yeah. or, the original and uh, like the, the, the enhanced first time. version. Yeah, the, the first enhanced, enhanced. Ver- which I actually think is the best version of the Star Wars original trilogy there ever was because there were no content edits. It was just cleaned up. Right. Yeah, they and then they put like the... they put like some CGI and the windows and stuff like that. Which I no, was that was okay. the special edition where they did that. The enhanced version. They now didn't... you're making me concerned. I don't know which yeah. one I've got. Yeah, the enhanced version. They didn't. They didn't CGI any stuff. They did like when when the ship cockpits were rotoscoped and you could see through the a pillars uh in mm-hmm. the original because it was you know comp uh comp uh, photography when they did that they solidified like the a pillars in the in the uh um cockpits and stuff like that and they cleaned up all the dust and scratches but that was to, in my opinion that's the best version of the original trilogy there ever was so that in, uh, but you know what that enhanced version i don't know if that ever came to dvd i think that was vhs only that that ever mm-hmm. came to all right, Microsoft finally owns uh, Activision Blizzard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you and Bobby Kotick can get along and absolutely. I mean, he is thankfully going to be leaving at the end of this year, but he's sticking well, around until the end of the year. He is absolutely the worst. Yes. Just the worst. The $68.7 billion deal, Xbox's lar- largest ex- acquisition ever, has now been finalized over more than 20 months of legal battles, primarily with the uh, FCC in the United States and the CMA in the UK that tried to block the merger, Call of Duty, Overwatch, Warcraft, Candy Crush, and many other game franchises are now wholly owned by Microsoft with plans to bring as many of them as possible to Xbox's Game Pass subscription streaming service. Many of the legal ba- battles focused almost entirely on the notion of the Call of Duty 
franchise potentially becoming exclusive to Xbox consoles, despite it not even being the biggest money maker amongst Activision Blizzard's many properties. Microsoft argued that they'd have that they have no intention of removing Call of Duty games from other consoles, similar to how My- Minecraft remains available on pretty much anything that can play it, since it's the only way to make the most money. But now it is official court record stated under oath that Call of Duty will remain on PlayStation consoles for at least the next 10 years with feature parody to the Xbox version and Microsoft even stating that stating that they'd bring Call of Duty games to Nintendo Switch as well, which wasn't even the thing that anyone was arguing about. And who actually cares? Well, Honestly. this is a pretty big industry shift uh, as far as video gaming goes. I don't. I don't love that Sony and Microsoft are buying up so many studios. It's not as though Sony hasn't done it as well. Yeah, um, they've all you done know, it. Not, not to this size. Activision Blizzard and is they, the largest acquisition by a large margin. But I don't they, love that. They just that. screw each other anyways. They yeah. always find some way to, you know, to, to make each version of the game yeah. slightly different so that you're like, oh, if I want to uh-huh. play the version that has Spider-Man in it, I need the PS5. If That's I want right. to play the version with you know, Wolverine in it, I got to <laughs> buy the Xbox version. You know, it's it's dumb. Yeah. It's, d- it's bad this, for everybody. This is a pretty seismic thing. Um, uh, I, I, I guess, I don't know. I didn't really think it was going to get through. I thought it was maybe a little bit too large and that it, it might get stopped. But uh, Microsoft does have an awful lot of money to throw at lawyers to uh, get their way. So they now own it. Activision Blizzard is theirs. World of Warcraft Candy Crush just belongs to Microsoft now, which is kind of a weird thing to even envision. Um, yeah, I mean, just... See, this is the problem. They just bought all these games and now they're going to be looking at them like, okay, how can we get our money back out of that? That's them? right. So, Whatever you didn't like about the game before is now going to get worse because almost certainly all the things that they were doing to make money, they're going to be doing them (laughs) even more and even harder. I don't know. I mean, so far, Microsoft's track record uh, on everything else that they bought, I'm like, I'm kind of wondering why they keep buying studios because there have been a lot fewer games that have Mm -hmm. actually been released from all the studios that Microsoft has purchased so far. And there's like, the fans are holding on to this idea that eventually the floodgates will open and there'll be this huge, you know, surge of really top quality titles from all of the studios that Microsoft has bought. But it it feels like within the past half a decade at least that like all the studios that Microsoft bought were like, oh, we just essentially cashed out and uh you know microsoft changed a bunch of uh the studio heads and the culture behind things and we're like trying to get away from you know crush at the end of releasing things and it's like stuff just hasn't come out where are all the games they've kind of disappeared from the landscape so i don't know if that's going to happen with activision blizzard as well i mean it would be hilarious to me if like call of duty suddenly becomes every two or three years instead of every year because they're owned by microsoft and they're just like oh wait we don't have to work you know like 16 hours every day weekends included uh we can we cannot do that anymore in real life yeah so work life balance Mm. i don't know i don't know fans if this is going to be everything that you hoped it would be but uh, there it is that's the news they own it now moving on gotta stop buying you got we just gotta stop buying games that are services just gotta start just only buy games that are games yep just buy and, the game and, where and you can buy the done, version and be done. Like release release in a playable form instead of having to wait an entire year for all the updates and, to make it playable. Yes, honestly. Rob and I absolutely so we bought Evolve, which I if you don't yep. remember that game, <laughs> yeah. welcome to the rest of the world. Okay. <laughs> Rob and I got very excited about that game because it was made by the same people who made uh Left for uh, Dead 2. Left 4 Dead 2 which and all was that. One stuff. of our favorites. Yes, and we played that all the time. Yeah. So we got very excited about that game. We bought, we pre-bought it, we yep. pre-ordered it, sure and when it came in, we played it, and we uh, we played it. I don't, I don't think I played it more than twice. <laughs> I think that's right. I think yep. I played it twice. I think yep. the number of times I played it with you was the number of times I played. That it. That seems about right. And then um, I watched some other people play it on Twitch, and I was like, "Wow, that's just." They're not even yeah. having fun. Nope. Like, nobody's having fun playing this game. It wasn't game. fun. <laughs> and and then it, then they it, it was a service and you had to do this and you had to do that and I was like, "You know what? That's it." Yep. That's it. And I I had high hopes for Back for Blood because that was a bunch of the people who had worked on yes. Left 4 Dead 2 and they went off like it was their own separate studio. I had high hopes for that. And I'm like, "You you just you just didn't 
understand why we all enjoyed Left 4 Dead 2 was the fact that half the people could play the humans and the other half could play the special zombies and yeah. you could fight against each other. They just took away the ability to play the zombies. They're like, no, it was all about just the humans. I'm like, that isn't what I loved about Left 4 Dead 2. It was that I could play as the zombies half the time. Yeah. And you just didn't do that. And then they like brought in this whole like randomized card system. I'm like, no. This is all junk. And like every ammo that you picked up was individual to each weapon. I'm like, this is stupid. It's not fun anymore. Go yeah. away. <laughs> yeah. So start, you know, basically buy completed games. Yep. Do not, you know, do not subscribe to services or they're going to just keep making these things. And definitely no loot boxes. <laughs> Comments from listeners. Infinite Gary needed to find a pair of very inexpensive headphones for a family member who, of his who is now 100 years old. Mm -hmm. Is it inexpensive? Okay, I'm not going to make that joke. Uh, he went with uh, Sony's ZX110 wired headphones that sell for $13 on Amazon. It's pretty hard like to complain person. about that price. <laughs> you yeah. must not like this person very much. He was very pleasantly surprised by their clarity and the fact that when connected to the TV's headphone output jack, that's unusual as well, they get plenty loud, but without any distortion, rather impressive. Oh, that's great, I guess. Well, Is I, that the I whole just thing? Look I just wanted to comment. I, I had mentioned these uh, headphones, this model. This is years ago. I got them for my niece uh, when They're we were traveling. $25 on Amazon, on my Amazon when I click on this. No, I saw them for 13 that's for sure. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I, I had mentioned these, so I don't know, maybe subliminally they worked their way into Gary's mind somehow, because I had mentioned these, and I too uh, was impressed, like, obviously for the price, but even, you know what, price aside, they ain't bad-sounding headphones. I mean, they're not, they're not the best ever, that's for sure, and they are definitely on-ear headphones, which is, I think, the least comfortable version, but oh, here they uh, are. $13. in my case, yeah, in my case <laughs> for... For a child, I thought they were a great choice. And of course, at the price point, I didn't care if they got lost or broken. I wasn't going to worry about it. So I think they're a very nice choice for nearly disposable and yet better than you might expect for the price headphones. I agree. So they're like 20 bucks without a mic and $30 there you with a mic, but they're on they're normally on sale. So you can yeah. get them for around... Under seven, 15, 13, definitely. Yeah, 13 they're, they're to findable. 13 to 18 or 13 to 18 dollars basically right. depending on the color the color makes a difference too yeah greg heard us mention the 99 dollar we mini we i don't know how to pronounce this the w-i-i -I capital m i don't know how they pronounce their brand name but that really is what it is we're gonna call it weem yeah. weem mini and 150 dollar weem pro wi-fi devices that can act as airplay 2 receiving devices with the weem pro also working like an old chromecast audio albeit at a higher price tag you want to draw the uh, attention to the fact that the weem pro model has another trick up its sleeve which is that you can plug a source device into the weem pro using its line in connection and then use the Weem Pro to transmit as an AirPlay 2 signal to any speakers that can play AirPlay 2 sources, like HomePod speakers or Sonos speakers, etc. Greg had been searching for a way to let him play his turntable on any and all of his wireless speakers around this house, and the Weem Pro accomplished that for a lot less money than the Sonos Connect, so we thought some other AV rent listeners might be interested. There you go. Yeah, that is a cool feature uh, that I didn't know was part of that Weem Pro. That is the $150 one. The Weem Mini doesn't have that ability because it doesn't have the line-in connection or the transmitting uh, option. But yeah, I uh, didn't know that was a feature. So that's cool that you're able to do that. You can hook up uh, any uh, RCA out uh, source device to the Weem Pro and then wirelessly send it to your AirPlay 2 connecting speakers. Cool. Nathan wanted to share an AVS form thread that he found very helpful for figuring out how to construct a false wall with an acoustically transparent screen. There are photos and how uh, and full how-to instructions. And while it isn't absolutely dead simple, it's a lot less complicated than a lot of the other builds he's seen. And it leaves everything behind the screen wall accessible if you need to get back there for any reason. So he thinks it's one of the better solutions he's come across and might be helpful to other AV Rant listeners. Are these pictures from the... Um, from him or from the no the these are these are i just captured from that avs forum thread okay. to which he linked we will have the link to it there are many more photos than what i've shared on youtube and in the flaker album this is just a sampling so you get the idea of what type of construction this is but yeah these are all like removable panels uh individual panels that are wrapped in uh basically speaker grill cloth or trans uh, acoustically transparent uh cloth of some type uh but that lets you remove panels to access any speakers or electronics that you might have hidden behind this false wall so if you were like yeah i'm 
I'm interested in constructing a false wall, but I'm not exactly sure how to do it step by step. Uh, I wouldn't exactly say the thread is literal step by step instructions, but it is detailed instructions with photographs for you to follow. So it could be a good resource. Julian, really enjoy our, co our cost no object home theater equipment list and how we remain somewhat practical even with unlimited budget. He works in construction and he's had jobs building uh, ultra high-end homes. He's seen some megabuck home theaters that have left him shaking his head, all the money in the world, and their hard reflective echo chambers with all the speakers in the ceiling, tiny subwoofers because they don't want to see any equipment, and then some $300,000 projector that they never even use. <laughs> Sounds yep. exactly right. Yep. So our list reminded him of one of his favorite Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes comic strips where Calvin says, if you could have anything in the world right now, what would it be? And Hobbes says, hmm, and Calvin says, anything at all, whatever you want. And Hobbes, which is the stuffed animal, if you don't remember, a sandwich. A sandwich? What kind of stupid wish is that? Talk about a failure of imagination. I asked for a trillion billion dollars, my own space shuttle on a private continent. And then uh, Hobbes is eating a sandwich and says, I got my wish. So there you go. <laughs> yes. Realistic, accomplishable wishes. That is that is the moral there. I, I didn't think that mine was all that accomplishable, at least with my budget. But indeed. okay. <laughs> but I, I <laughs> didn't display doable. that comic strip uh, on the YouTube version because I don't want us taken down from YouTube for copyright infringement. Uh, but uh, if you want to see it, it'll be in the Flickr album, so you can link through that way. <laughs> there you go. On a different topic, Julian tried our suggestions of using his Panasonic UB420's dual HDMI output to send video directly to his projector while an audio-only signal got sent to his receiver. He had been experiencing lip sync issues before and it was inconsistent from move to movie, so he could never find a suitable audio delay setting that he could just set and forget, splitting mm -hmm. the HDMI signals worked. It's nice to know that there was a solution. However, he could not stand seeing the receivers, uh, not being able to see the receiver's volume and info menus on his screen, so he switched back and just puts up with the address adjustment the audio delay <laughs> setting on a disc by disc basis you do you man from That's searching right. online the this lip sync issue seems to be a common complaint from panasonic owners and yet his fire stick tv doesn't seem to suffer the same issue when he's streaming so that's strange it's not strange it's stupid but it is what it is, and here we are. This is the world we live in. Yeah, that's that's it. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I'd be happy that at least there is a solution. So we, we said something that was potentially helpful, but it didn't quite retain all the features that he wanted. So, yep, that's that's the choice he's left with making at this point. But uh, I don't know. Look, if you, if you switch over to a Sony Ultra HD Blu-ray player, maybe the lip sync will be better, but then you have to manually switch Dolby Vision on and off. So, you know, there ain't, there ain't no Six free Six of lunch. one, half dozen of the other, my yep. man. Yep. Ryan wanted to update us about his attempts to get his Marantz receiver, the one that keeps randomly going to, into the Odyssey setup mode, repaired. Marantz support finally got back to him. It took a couple, couple of weeks of sending his support ticket request via their website, but they, they did eventually reply, and they gave him uh, they, they gave instructions for doing a firmware restore. Well, that sounds like it's a bad idea, but let's see what happens. He says that went poorly. Yeah. The front display showed the receiver working on the firmware restore for about 10 minutes, and then it said complete, and then it 100% died. When it power on, when it responded to anything, unplugging, re-unplugging, or replugging, nothing. So his issue was sent to Marantz's escalation team. There was some back and forth, but they agreed to have it repaired at one of their authorized partners. No charge to him, even though it's out of warranty, although he has to pay for the shipping. Since he no longer had the box and packing material, they sent all of that to him at no charge whatsoever. So that's nice. Yeah. Uh, he he wanted to reassure us that there's been no animosity or anger on either side, and Marantz's support was actually very good and always kind of kind and professional. Just a bit slow to respond, but all in all, he's satisfied with the outcome. I mean, yep. they broke it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's why they agreed to uh, send it to the authorized repair center. If it hadn't gone 100% broken due to what they told you to do to yeah, it, yeah. they probably would have required that you pay the out-of-warranty uh, charge for the repair. Right. But uh, So in a way... I guess you're kind of lucky that, yeah. <laughs> that it just completely bricked it when you did what they told you to do. Uh, that's that's right. also unfortunate, but uh, regardless, I, I I hope it all gets fixed and repaired at you know the cost of shipping, but that's got to be less than buying a whole new AV receiver. So there you go. I hope it all comes back to you and works the way it should. Me too. All right, questions here. Will, uh, traditional projectors versus ultra short throw projectors? I bit my lip the other day, so mm. you know, like when you bite your lip and then it like I feels sure like do. your lips in the way of you yep. talking. That's where I'm. That's where I'm living right now. Okay. And this ultra short throw, <laughs> saying that over and over again is going to get me. I'm gonna it bite is a tongue twister. Again. All right. 
From what Will is seeing, it seems as though UST or ultra, ultra short throw projectors are getting more and more popular, especially now that some of them officially support Dolby Vision. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of what we predicted, right? We th we said that if we were going to have Dolby Vision on a projector, it would probably be a UST projector, because you could, especially if they came, if it came, came bundled with a screen, with a screen, yeah. I don't know if I'm going to give ourselves full points and credit for that, but yeah, nah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So could we explain the general differences to him? What advantages do UST projectors have over traditional projectors, and vice versa? Well, the big advantage is that. You don't have to have a projector at the back of your room for sure. the short short throw ones. Um, I mean, ultra short throw. I mean, I've done reviews of those types of projectors before. Mm -hmm. They are um, generally speaking a lot easier to set up. I think mm -hmm. because I mean, in some ways, and then in yeah. others, they're not. So it's a little bit of a trade off there. Yeah. So you 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 know basically you put the, the screen on your wall. You put the mm -hmm. projector in front of the screen. Sometimes as few as a couple of inches, like six, yeah. eight, ten inches in front of the screen, and you're done. You know, as, a, sure. as opposed to the the projector, which you have to usually hang from the ceiling or put on a, a, a stand someplace or a shelf someplace, which is way at the back of the room. And you usually mm -hmm. have, need very many feet, <laughs> let's say <laughs> meters, sure. to 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 get to the right image size. So the Ultra short throw has that advantage of being able to uh, be more self-contained at the front of your room. Where, yeah, you know, you no longer have the long HDMI runs. You never right. you no longer have the run. The, the 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 one of the big differences I think, or the main drawbacks of the UST projector over the traditional projector is, you know, they really are only good at this point at specific sizes, and they they're kind of limited in that they kind of go up to a hundred. They'll tell you they'll go bigger because they can they can go bigger. Sure, but they really do best at one hundred and twenty inches, like one hundred and twenty inches yeah. where they live. That's like their sweet spot. Yeah, and any <laughs> and smaller down to like. I mean, 100, right. definitely. They're the ones that do 100. They come bundled yeah. with the 100-inch screen, for sure. Yeah. So I would say, like, between 90 and 120 is kind of where they live. And anything bigger or smaller than that, they don't do so well. Mm -hmm. So uh, you end up with, uh, you know, a more limited screen size. Like, if you want a really big screen or, you know, yeah. if you want a smaller one uh, because of where you sit in relation to it, you're more limited than what you get. Mm -hmm. Um you know, the yeah, it tends to be fairly fixed focal ranges, so it'll be yeah. it'll be a if it is adjustable at all because some of them are just some of them are just a fixed lens and they come bundled with the size of screen that yeah. the focus is set for and that's it that's your only choice. Some of them give you a focus and size range, but it's very very limited. It'll ju be just between one hundred and one twenty. Some of them it's a toggle; <laughs> they literally right. have just a toggle. And then there are UST projectors that allow you to go as high as one hundred and fifty inches, but I don't think i've seen larger than that and the models yeah. that do that are quite rare so if you were going for a projection screen larger than 150 you pretty much have to go to traditional at that point yeah um you know you, of course there's a lot more options at a lot more price points if you go with a traditional projector uh mm -hmm. and that's i think just uh, economy of scale there's a lot more yeah. of them that are out there so if you were on the budget you know your usd projectors they exist so there's budget ones out there but boy they ain't they're not very good <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> so you know. i mean practically and physically uh there can definitely be advantages to a usd projector because it is going to be at the front of your room it's going to be living directly below the projection yeah. screen and that means if you have just a regular sort of like tv stand where you keep the equipment you can have a battery backup that's in a normal location you yeah. can plug the usd projector directly into it without any sort of extension you can have a normal length hdmi cord and plug that in if all of your equipment lives up at the front of the room whereas uh, with a traditional projector that's definitely going to be closer to the back of your room, if not right at the back of your room, unless you also have your equipment live at the back of the room and you're plugging things in there, you very often need to deal with either a long cable run or yeah. routing things through the ceiling. That means you need in-wall rated cables and then there's the whole issue of power if you do want to have a battery backup. Do you have a separate battery backup that lives next to your traditional projector or do you do a proper you know, uh, extension run of the power cable so that you can plug it into a battery backup unit that lives elsewhere so 
that's physical considerations to get into, uh, and they are different there. Um, for the like setting it up, the projector with the screen. I mean, in many cases with the ultra short the projector, it's gonna be much easier to like set the projector where it's going to live, and then have it project onto the wall, and then mount your screen where the image shows up. Because the adjustability of the UST projector is next to nothing, right? You really just have the physical placement that you do with it, and because it's such a steep and extreme angle, a tiny, tiny physical shift yeah. of the ultra short throw projector results in a large trapezoidal shaped shift to the image that gets projected. So if you're living in a situation where that UST projector ever gets physically touched, physically knocked by a dog or a child or just somebody walking by who's being a little bit careless, like it can you know, throw the the projected image way out of whack really, really easily. So that's a consideration on that side of it. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, a projector that's hanging from your ceiling or up a positioned on a coffee table could also get knocked, uh, but they just tend to be more adjustable and the uh, amount that the image changes isn't quite as extreme uh, because of the angle. But the main difference is that the ultra short throw projectors, because they're projecting nearly vertically straight up, can use the specialized sawtooth type of screens yeah. that only reflect the light that's shooting up at them at a very steep angle, and then actually have like light absorbing on the flat part of the sawtooth part of the screen, so that any light that's coming from above is very effectively um, absorbed by the screen. Or not and, just from above, but from other other angles as I well. I mean, predominantly from above, though, because if it's coming in like at a similar angle to the projector but from the sides you are still going to get that light yeah it's it's the light from above that gets really effectively tamped down uh whereas we do have you know so-called ambient light rejecting screens for traditional projectors but they aren't as effective um at, at completely reducing the light because they have to be able to project the light that came from the back of the room bounced off the screen and comes back to your eyes sure. other if you have other sources of light in the room, some of that is going to be coming at similar angles and it's it's going to wash out the image a bit more. So by and large, you can get away with using an ultra short projector with the specialized sawtooth type of screen with a bit more ambient light in your room. And that's the predominant reason I think they're sort of like getting a bit more hype and a and bit more marketing because uh, the, the companies know that most people don't have a completely bat cave room to yeah. use a projector. Like you can use this ultra short projector with the specialized screen in a fairly normally lit room. It is not going to have flat panel like black levels. It's not going to be equal to LCD flat panel black levels, let alone OLED. It's not even going to come remotely close to touching OLED black levels but it's going to be a less washed out little bit better looking image with that specialized screen with some ambient light than sure. a traditional projector so that's the main difference there but on the, the flip side yeah. if you do have the light controlled room the traditional projectors by and large with the models that are available at at most of the price points we're, uh, price points we're looking at they have better black levels and contrast from the traditional projectors most of the ultra short their projectors we're seeing are the dlp ones based on the 1080p chip that's getting wobbled four times and the native black level and contrast of that chip just isn't as good as what you can get from a traditional projector you're starting with grayer blacks to begin with but if you're using Using it in a room with some ambient light, you're not going to notice, right? It's going to get washed out to at least that level or more in an ambient lit room. So there's, I think it makes sense in those uh, places where it's like, yeah, I can't afford a flat panel that large. I'm going to have some ambient light. The ultra short throw with the specialized screen does make sense. But if you have the light controlled room, I think you can get better performance for the dollar from a traditional projector. So I think that's pretty much all the pluses and minuses. Well, the other thing they don't tell you is that that specialized screen that is that that basically makes this whole thing possible. Yeah. Is probably about the same price as the projector itself. It you can know, be for sure. It, yeah. it, it can be if you get the really good ones, you're gonna be yeah. doubling the price of the Yeah, they're gonna be at least projector. in the thousand to fifteen hundred dollar range for the good ones for the ultra yeah. short throws, uh, you know, sawtooth type screens. Yeah. yeah. Uh, specifically at the $3,000 price point, which traditional projector would we recommend? Which UST projector would we recommend? And which one would we say is the best, better choice? It all depends on your room in your it really case. Does. I yeah. mean, I, I, there is no better choice. The better choice is, depends on your space. You yeah. have full light control, mm -hmm. then get a traditional projector if you yep. can. If you have limited space and other issues, you know, you can't, you, you have no way of running an HDMI cable to the back of your room. Right. Well, then... 
it doesn't make any difference if you have a light control. You can't run an HDMI cable to the back yeah. of your room. You're going to start asking us about, you know, wireless HDMI solutions, and we're going to have to break your heart about that. So you might as well, just, you know, you look at the room and you fit the display solution for yeah. the space. Yeah. Um, yes, there's better. There's going to be better options out there. What's the best option? An OLED. A big OLED that you sit close <laughs> enough to that doesn't make any difference. If you are 120 inches, that is not an option. Yeah, You're going to exactly. have to go with a projector. So I'll start with what I would say for under $3,000 for an ultra short throw projector. I'm going to point you to LG. Uh, I'm pretty much always going to point you to LG when it comes to ultra short throw because if you are going to watch HDR content on an ultra short throw projector, I want the one that can do frame by frame dynamic tone mapping and that's LG. Uh, they have the frame by frame dynamic tone mapping, yeah, mapping and pretty much nobody else does so they do have a model that is MSRP $3,000 it's been on sale recently for $2,500 uh, and that is their HU715QW that is one of these ones that uses the 1080p panel that wobbles four times per frame but it has the frame by frame dynamic tone mapping uh, and DLP based and convenient to set up so that's the model I point you to uh, now for a traditional projector in the $3,000 or less uh, I would have to point you to Epson's 5050UB that that is the one I would go to. It's been on sale recently down to $2,400, uh, but is regularly priced at $300. Um, and then if you're able to wiggle your way up to $3,500 and you want one that can actually show you all 4K resolution uh, and in fact has a laser light engine, that's not the reason I'm recommending it. It's more of that the Epson 5050UB can take a 4K signal, but it wobbles its 1080p panel twice per frame. So you aren't actually getting all of the pixels on screen. Uh, the LS11000, which you can find for $3,500 these days has the laser light engine. It is still 1080p panels, panels, but it wobbles them four times per frame. So you actually get all uh, 4K resolution onto the screen when you're doing that. And it can even do 4K 120, uh, which neither of the other two options can do. So that's what you'd be paying for going over the $3,000 budget. It, let, let's put it in terms of if I had a light controlled room and just a standard white screen, both of those Epson projectors absolutely blow the LG projector out of the water. Yeah. Uh, the, the black levels on the Epsons are vastly superior. The contrast is superior. Uh, so in a light controlled room with a white screen, they win hands down. And as long as I can run the HDMI cable, that's the way I'm going. But if you have a room where it's like, yeah, the walls are all white. I have lights on in this room or I have windows that I can't fully close. Then the ultra short throw makes more sense as long as you get the sawtooth screen to go along with it. Right. Carl. Carl knew that he wanted to upgrade a 65. Is it this J Carl? We J gotta Carl, make sure. sorry. Yeah, it's J I, Carl. There we I, go. I, I skipped right over the J. <laughs> J Carl knew he wanted to upgrade a 65 inch LG C7 OLED, but he wasn't totally sure whether he wanted a 77 or 83 inch. So he took our advice that we usually give for making a subwoofer decision and built a cardboard box. I actually just wrote this article. Yep. It was not about this specifically. But this is what I basically said uh, yep. to do. So and I am showing an image where the outer dimensions of this cardboard box where is what an 83 inch would look like. And then he's drawn a rectangle inside of it, which is what the 77 inch would look like. It's a bit hard to see in our document, but there's a, a rectangle he's drawn inside of the cardboard. Yeah. So we can see 77 versus 83. So what I'd said was like, if you have your TV already on the wall and you uh -huh. want to see with a new one, then you just uh, like a fix cardboard like using sure. painters tape around around yep. the outside to just show you what the new space would look like because a lot of people argue about you know with their spouse or mm -hmm. significant other about what the tv what size tv and then what they do is they go to the store they look at it they go that's way too big like oh what yeah <laughs> you don't know you're how standing it looks right next to it <laughs> yeah you're standing you know nose to it of course right. it's too big uh putting it in your space and living with it you can yep. actually you know, his TV that's currently on the wall, he could have done what he did with the cardboard box mm -hmm. around the outside of it and said, oh, this doesn't look too big. Anyways, mm -hmm. Thanks to that experiment, he quickly decided the 77 inch would be perfectly fine and the 83 inch wouldn't be worth the additional cost to him. And you can kind of see from this box and the lines that the 83 is in fact bigger, but it is not really all sure. that much bigger for him. <laughs> Uh, furthermore, he had been waiting for any exciting improvements to OLED TVs, and it seems as though micro, lay, uh, micro lens array on the G LG G3 and brighter second generation QD OLED panels from Samsung and Sony fit that bill. But both of these technologies only go up to 77 inch size and aren't available at the 83 inches yet, so it all fit together to make the decision for him. Now, mm -hmm. He's been happy with his LG C7, so he is naturally considering a new 77 inch LG 
G3 with the micro lens array, but the brand new Sony A95L QD OLED was just crowned the king of 4K TVs at mm -hmm. Value Electronics's uh, annual shootout. It seems like reviewers and people online are more hyped about the QD OLEDs and at the Sony uh, A95L in particular. So should that be his new TV or is there a case to be made for the LG G3? Let me tell you something right now. Uh -huh. It does not matter. <laughs> Buy the I mean, cheapest the one. The short answer is you can't go wrong. You, right. you can, you can throw, You've got you, two excellent options. If you put them right next to each other, you can go... I can kind of see that this one's a little bit better than that one, or maybe you won't. Uh, you know what I mean? It's maybe, really maybe splitting hair. Even with you need measurement equipment to see the difference. Yeah. You're like, do I want? You know, or like a mastering monitor right beside them to yeah. compare them to? Yes, because <laughs> you might uh, be able to a, see a difference a between the two, but which one is actually correct would be impossible to know without a reference monitor to uh, compare them to at the time. And I, you know what? I'm going to put the Samsung QD OLEDs in here too, because if you got one of those, I wouldn't blame you. And I'm going to tell you that particularly at the 77 inch size, I actually think it makes more sense to get the S90C from Samsung as opposed to the S95C. That They're never going to let you back on Reddit if you start recommending Samsung. They oh, hate not... Samsung Oh, over I there. see. Okay, Samsung overall. But particularly at the 77 inch size, the panels in the S90C 77 inch and the panel in the S95C 77 inch are identical <laughs> there is no difference there's a slight difference at the 55 and 65 inch sizes but at the 77 there is absolutely zero picture quality difference between the s90c and the s95c in the samsung lineup the frames are a little bit different and the s95c has that separate one connect box which actually lowers the hdmi bandwidth a little bit versus the ones that are built in to the s90c so given that the s90c costs less that might i honestly that might be the one you go to it might not be a sony or the lg g3 it might be a samsung's s90c because you can get it at a lower price and it is absolutely splitting hairs between any of these three uh as to which is the absolute best that all said i can tell you flat out if you are a high 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 end gamer then LG's G3 still has a little bit of an advantage on the 4K 120 Dolby Vision VRR support. The new, brand new Sony theoretically can check all the green boxes on your Xbox Series X, but not today. You are still mm. waiting for a promised firmware update on that Sony A95L to actually give you Dolby Vision 120 hertz support. And Sony is still making you choose in the menu for your HDMI inputs, whether you support 4K 120 with VRR or 4K with Dolby Vision. You can't do both at the same time. As of today, that might change if the promised firmware update comes, but we know better than to buy anything based on promises we when it comes to that, firmware yeah. updates. So, if, it, if you're a really high-end gamer, I'm going to argue that the LG G3 is just the easy choice. Everything works. It works today, and we don't have to wait for any promises as far as firmware updates go. But aside from that... Uh, I really don't think you can go wrong. The Samsungs, of course, do not have Dolby Vision at all. So if you really want to see that logo light up, you will never get Dolby Vision on one of the Samsung options. But I can definitely make an argument for spending less and getting an S90C, particularly at the 77-inch screen size. So honestly, you can't go wrong. You're going to feel great about any of them. But if you're a high, high-end gamer, I'm going to argue the G3. The end. Ilongo. Ilongo wants to get a 65-inch TV for his conference room. He'd be using it to show his laptop screen for meetings mostly, but sometimes it'll also be showing TV shows, mostly sports. He'd like to keep the budget $1,000 or less. He's in Canada, but shopping from the States is easy for him if there's any issues uh, with particular model availability. What do we suggest? Um, I, get, I mean, for the uh, conference rooms, you generally don't care about black levels all that much because you're going to have, you know. Not as much. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't imagine that you're going to be able to black the entire thing out anyways. And even if you could, you wouldn't want to because there's usually mm -hmm. more than one person in there that want to be able to do stuff. Plus, you're definitely going to have somebody looking at their phone at some point sure. during this thing. So there's going to yeah. be light in the room. Uh, that said, there's no reason why you can't get something with you know at least some local uh, zones yeah. of dimming. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to make an argument for Hisense 
in this case. Uh, I'm going to suggest going with Hisense's U7 series. Uh, so this will be the uh, the U7K at this point. That's still the uh, model year that we're in. Um, it is available Canada easily. Uh, it's 1100 Canadian dollars, but I think we're pretty close to the budget. I'm not sure if he was actually saying 1000 US dollars or 1000 Canadian dollars, uh, but it's definitely within striking distance. If there is sales during Black Friday, we're going to get under 1000 Canadian dollars quite easily. Uh, it's available for 730 US dollars, which at straight exchange rate, if it's easy for you to pop across the border is still a cost savings even paying the duties and taxes coming back across so you could pop down to the states and save yourself a uh, little over a hundred bucks if you went that way but Hisense's uh, U7K is going to be my talk re top recommendation here uh, contrast is really good on that model has nice full array local dimming performs really quite nicely and the advantage that I think it has uh, for a conference room setting is that it has one of the nicer anti-glare uh, coatings on the screen for this model so assuming that you this is going to be a fairly brightly lit room I'm going to want a screen that combats any sort of glare from lights that are on in the room uh, a little bit better and the high since U7K does that. Now, if there's just availability problems or you find a better price on it, TCL's 65-inch uh, Q7 series is very much a contemporary, very, very close, but doesn't have quite as good a uh, anti-glare screen as the Hisense and doesn't have quite as wide viewing angles as well, which I would also think for a conference room, you might want wider viewing angles if people are seated around. So I favor the Hisense a little bit here, but the TCL Q7 series, if it's just easier to get or cheaper where you're buying, uh, still a very good choice. Also going for $1,100 Canadian, $700 in the US. So a little bit of price savings there if you pop, pop across the border. Uh, so both of those are, are the ones I would look at there. One little thing I wanted to mention is conference room. I think you might be connecting a, a computer to it. Um, both of these use the essentially only option in town now which is instead of the pixels being laid out as rgb they're laid out as bgr blue green red instead of red green blue and for video that makes no difference at all but for reading text from a computer uh thanks to the way that clear type works and sub pixel rendering where they actually like dither the sub pixels not just entire pixels at a time to make text look a little bit clearer uh doesn't work so well on the bgr layout but there isn't really an option it's not like I can point you to something that has the RGB layout other than an OLED, <laughs> which uh, I, is not going to fit in this price range for the 65-inch size and probably isn't the right choice for a conference room anyway. So uh, you might have to fiddle with the clear type settings if you're using a Windows PC to get text looking properly sharp. The easier solution typically is to just increase the size of the font by zooming in all of Windows or increasing the size of the text, which again, for a conference room, I'm thinking if you're doing it, you might be making the text somewhat large anyway. It's probably not going to be pixel perfect 4k resolution tiniest type that you could if you're doing any sort of presentation so likely not a problem but just warning you that you might need to fiddle with the clear type settings to get text looking its best all right dan dan got to take in a store demo that svs put on in worldwide stereo in montgomery pennsylvania that, yeah. i believe so yeah. i think that's right he thought it was I'm, killer I'm relying on the american to know those, that, those abbreviations i don't know <laughs> He left with an SVS t-shirt, but also desired to learn more about the brand and their products. He really enjoyed all the speakers they demoed, which sounded very nice and powerful. And the subwoofers were, were store shaking. However, they didn't demo <laughs> any of their cylinder subs. And Dan knows both of us are particularly fans of the cylinders. So why? <laughs> Is it purely about their physical placement flex, uh, flex, flexibility, or do they perform better in some way due to their tube-like shape? I already told you why we like them. <laughs> just it was a thought that already popped into Tom's head. Yes, uh, the reality is 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 they perform. Uh, whatever they say they perform, they perform, and they're sure. they're in the two thousand series. They perform like a two thousand series sub. You, yes. Normally, a ported one uh, that you would look at the ported box and the cylinder box, the cylinder, and they mm -hmm. would perform similarly. I think the the cylinder exceedingly is similarly. <laughs> yeah, the, you can make some some slight different claims about them, and they would be not incorrect but at the same okay. time they would also be like who cares no, it's, 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 about it's the same. way more similar than any difference yeah. yes so we like them because they're cool and if you don't like them <laughs> you're not cool so that's why we like them oh so. okay that's the simple answer. I'm, I mean, my thing is it, it really is mostly about the physical characteristics, which is that they are physically lighter, right? If you look at a PB2000 yes, Pro versus a PC2000 Pro cylinder, the PC2000 Pro cylinder weighs less, 
that's easier to physically move around or if you're moving or just adjusting things in your theater or out of your theater or moving to a new location that's easier to deal with they are just physically easier to deal with uh if you i like that if you bump into them like i've got a very small theater i have to physically rub against a subwoofer to get to my chairs i'd rather do that on a round cylinder covered in essentially industrial carpet than on a physical box with potentially sharp edges uh which svs rounds their edges a little bit but you can still knock a knee into an svs yeah. sub pretty darn good uh whereas an svs uh, cylinder sub you can kind of ram right into it and you're never going to injure yourself i kind of like that so look you can put them on your side on their sides you can roll them around <laughs> you can uh lay it down on its side and tuck it behind a uh sofa without taking up as much floor space the floor space it takes up standing vertically as intended is less so just physically they fit better and one other advantage is Price for price, because the price on, say, a PC2000 box versus a PC2000 Pro cylinder is the same, but the cylinder comes with the isolation feet already that attached, and that's, that's an like... extra added cost for the box. So you're kind of getting a little uh, added bonus there, uh, price for price, because you're getting the um, the decoupling feet already attached to the cylinder. So that's a nice little bonus. So those are the main reasons. It's not that the cylinder in some sort of extension or uh, output, uh, you know, loudness or distortion, or it's not those type of metrics. Those are absolutely a wash between the two. All right. He was a little bit surprised uh, how much he liked the SVS's speakers. He's pretty sure the entire model lineup was present, including the self-powered Prime Wireless Pro, which he thought sounded darn impressive. Mm -hmm. Gary Yakubian was there. And when Dan mentioned to him that he thought all of SVS's speakers performed above their asking price, Gary said that was always their goal with each of their products. Dan was particularly taken with the clarity and the dynamic range. So Tom is rocking a full SVS speaker setup now, correct? Yes. Or at least he would be if he weren't for the floor repair, flood repairs. That is also true. Yeah. Right now, my center channel speaker is a laptop stand. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's what it is. so how satisfied am I? What's better and what's worse versus Tom's previous speaker setup? And if Tom were to upgrade his speakers, what would he get and why? RBH was mentioned when we talked about our cost, no object choices. What would be the benefits over the SVS speakers? Um, so SVS, had their speaker line is great. And you're right. Mm -hmm. It is a cost. You know, you are getting a uh, a product that is worth the price and more. If it the, is it, good bang for buck. Yes. And we and we love the customer service that stands behind it because we know yes. if you ever have a problem with one of their speakers, they're not going to leave you high and dry if you give them a call. So uh, we, we like that too. That I, I mean, that it's perfectly fair to factor that into the yes, price. It is. You know, that, that's a consideration. Um, and so the, the, the reason why they didn't make it into the cost no object is because they don't have a product that fits into that. They don't have like <laughs> a like flagship. They have a flagship for their line, mm -hmm. but they don't have a flagship for like the world. Like we sure. the, the cost no object speaker, like, you know, the Kef yeah. Blade speakers, the Muons or whatever they're called, the yeah. other ones are, which is just like we didn't, we didn't have any restrictions on price or anything else. Yeah. So, you know, yes, they sound very good. Now, how much better would a cost no object speaker sound versus what you get from SVS? In most rooms, I would venture to say, could you hear the difference? Yes. Would you go, mm -hmm. is this worth literally <laughs> right. hundreds of thousands of dollars more? You would almost, in, I, I think on almost every case, you would say no. Yeah, we would call that a case of diminishing returns. Uh, that improvement per dollar is definitely starting to get very, very low. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as, you, as you go. So above. the SVS speakers, when I compare, you know, we talk about like comparing speakers and how hard it is to do, you know, mm -hmm. if you're not in your own room. But it's also really hard to do over time. So let's talk about, mm -hmm. you know, when I switched from the SVS speakers uh, from the Epirion of Eris Grand, which is their mm -hmm. very first model of that the first That's generation one. of the various grants yes. yeah so what they have now is probably not the same or it doesn't sound exactly the same as what i had then sure um so it's not it, it's not apples to apples when i switched i didn't do a b comparisons i didn't go back and forth mm -hmm. and try to do everything mostly because of space i just you know the, the space in that room the problem i was having with the appearing uh various grand speakers more than anything is that they're just too dang big mm -hmm. they had tower speakers and it was just they were which they like, that's are, not appearance fault if you no. had bookshelves that wouldn't have been the case but the no. ones that you owned were physically larger than the space that you have yeah and i was having problems getting the 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 main speakers to resolve as mm -hmm. far as like mm -hmm. getting a good center 
center image, and the physically smaller, even though they're not tiny, bookshelf uh, speakers that I have from uh, SVS are just easier to place and mm -hmm. easier to manipulate around and to uh, to get to, to sound better. Yeah, um, but if you had gone with, say, Ultra Towers, that probably wouldn't have been the case. You would have worn yeah, the same Yeah, exact same situation. <laughs> if, exactly. If that, in fact, maybe even way. worse because yeah. the towers have a bigger footprint than I think yeah. the Aperion Grands do. Right. Veris Grands do. So, um, you know, sound quality wise, I don't know that there's a, a massive difference between mm. the Ultra bookshelves and what I had before uh, with the Aperion uh, Grand. And in fact, and I, we've been saying this over and over again on this podcast in the last couple of months, if not years, is, you know, yes, you can hear differences when you A, B. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can find that there's differences between, you know, different, co different cost speakers. But generally speaking, what you're paying for is extension in, in mostly in the bass re region. So sure. when you when you spend more on a speaker, you get more extension, maybe in the treble, somewhat in the treble, mm -hmm. but also mostly in the bass. So that suddenly a speaker can play a lot lower, which I do not care about. And you shouldn't either because we all have subwoofers if we listen <laughs> to this podcast. But you're also paying for output of which I don't need that. I don't mm -hmm. need having that much out. So what I'm really looking for is clarity and you know stuff like transient response and mm -hmm. off axis you know off axis response and a lot of these speakers are exceedingly similar when it comes to mm -hmm. these things because you know you have you know you can get good at a fairly reasonable price point and then to go from good to great or maybe to from great to excellent you got to spend a lot of money sure you know and you it just does not get that much better yeah. at least in my mind so so, I mean, know, I think that was exactly it. Like, Dan heard them. He's like, oh, like, put put price aside. These are just really good sounding speakers. Exactly. So then what what am I getting? Like, what am I upgrading? If I, if I spend a whole bunch more, what am I getting for that? So we're saying, like, there could be a difference, but it's going to be a small difference. It's not going to be like going from your TV speakers to SVS speakers. That's some, a massive difference. Right. And it's going to be easy to justify the price. Uh, but going from SVS speakers to, you know, RBH's flagships, we're not going to say there's no difference. The RBH is probably, in some metrics, measure a little bit better and... Yeah sound a little bit better as long as you have the right environment but it's going to be a smaller difference from going from the svs to the rbh flagships than it is going from tv speakers to svs by a country mile and i mean i would just weigh in to say like you know the ascend sierra ral sure. speakers that i went with and i said even cost no object if i'm putting together a music-based system in a smaller contained room where i'm the only listener they they are remain my very very top choice i don't care if i have all in the money in the world i'm still gonna get those speakers i think they sound great what do i think they do slightly better than svs's speakers and honestly the price points are not that different the essentia are, are are a bit more uh but they aren't you know mega buck speakers um the the one metric i can just point to it is objectively measurably true is the transient response yes. in the treble that that ribbon tweeter does it is faster on the ascend there's, there's speakers. no doubt about that it just is I, whether I'm correct about this or not, I can't say with 100% certainly, but I attribute the effect that I think is very difficult to measure and say this is the measurement that, that correlates exactly to this is just the occasional uncanny sense of realism where the hairs on the neck, back of your neck kind of stand up or if you have a dog, they like, they poke up their ears and look at where the sound came from, where there's like that weird little uncanny realism that not all speakers quite get to. My experience has been the Ascensiera Asen Rowles get there sometimes more than other speakers. I mean, it very much depends on the recording. Uh, sure. But I've experienced that more frequently with the Essentia RLs. So I think it has something to do with that transient response, but I can't prove that 100%. No, I don't know if yeah. that's the case. That would be that's just hard kind of proof. <laughs> it's, it's just kind of the only metric I can point to to say where that's where the measurable difference is, <laughs> that I know there is a measurable difference, so I'm going to correlate those two things. I don't know if I'm right about that, but that's the sort of difference that I would talk about, but it is a very small difference. Yeah, so the question you might ask it. yourself is, okay, so it's, you know, when you buy, spend more on a speaker and you get like a different tweeter design, you know, you can get or different driver, different driver, you know, composition, meaning, you know, the, oh, these are Kevlar ones or whatever they woven, <laughs> woven fiberglass, whatever they're calling them these days. And this is a beryllium tweeter versus mm -hmm. a ribbon tweeter versus, you know, you know, aluminum magnesium, which is like the one step down from beryllium. these yeah. days. And you're like, OK, well, you get this better. What that's 
that's also not the case. You can actually get like a, a soft dome silk yep. tweeter that is super duper high end. Yep. It's harder to make and it's harder to implement correctly into a, a, a speaker. But it is, it is there. Are, it, it's not just I'm looking for my next speaker to have a ribbon tweeter, which people do. Mm. They're like, I want a ribbon tweeter. You know, I the I mean, that's what the 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 synaptic synap. I don't know what they're called. Synaptic, S1 synaptic, or yeah. whatever. Uh, they they have ribbon drivers in them, right? Yeah. And it's you know, great. I mean, they sound great. Now, do they sound perfect? They do not. They still, I, I still or believe they don't. Just being a ribbon guarantee it. No, right. It's got to yeah. be implemented and applied. There's a correctly. whole bunch more yeah. that goes into it. So that's why we say, you know, once you get to a certain level of speaker, you end up just trading things off you know yeah. like okay so now i've i've got a, a two thousand uh, three two thousand dollar speakers mm -hmm. to look at one of them's got a soft dome one of them's got a uh you know uh you know a ribbon tweeter and one of them's got you know something else i don't know mm -hmm. a concentric driver like a yeah. cap or something like that you know which one's the best one i'm like i don't i mean they probably sound almost exactly the same like yeah. they sound probably i would similar. i would say again it, it mostly comes back to your room and seating distance because yeah. there are the speakers that can just flat out play louder yes. or play louder using fewer watts or like you know they or they have the combination of higher sensitivity and higher power handling and if you have the room and setup that requires that then that's an easy like objective figure it out by math reason why you might get different speakers yeah chris chris is trying to help his son set up a surround sound system with the way the room is laid out if he positions his surround speakers as close to where they should be as possible it's really inconvenient to run speaker wire to them is there a way to connect them wirelessly the receiver is denon not one of the higher end models and the speakers are def tech mythos gems so they just have regular binding posts any guidance would be uh, appreciated do you have pre-outs? <laughs> this is a very important part well, of this Well, thankfully, thing. like the solution I'm going to suggest doesn't require them. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. So I did write an article, or maybe it was me. I don't remember who, I wrote, who wrote the article, <laughs> about how to add uh, wireless speakers to your, sure. to your setup. And um, when you do that, if you have uh, uh, pre-outs, it's pretty easy. You, there's a sure. lot of different solutions out there that will allow you to connect like a wireless transmitter just mm -hmm. from the pre-out and then you it, it will have an amplifier on the other side which rob is going to talk about uh, a little bit here but yeah. uh the 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 problem andrew wrote it the problem with um not having pre-outs is you have to use those speaker level uh outputs to do it and that's right th that can be problematic it certainly can be, but thankfully, uh, Amphony is still around. A M P H O N Y. Uh, Amphony is still around with their Model 1800, and this really solves this issue. If you're like, I gotta run wireless surrounds, and I don't have preouts because I don't have a receiver that's expensive enough to include preouts for the surround channels, this can be a solution. So what's nice here? There's the transmitting unit uh, that, of course, will sit by your AV receiver. On the back of that transmitting unit are speaker wire inputs as well as line level input so you can just use the surround speaker binding post with regular speaker wire but it'll connect to this transmitter instead of going directly to the speaker so that can of course be a very short speaker wire run to there so from there what i like about the model 1800 is you get two physically separate amplifiers and the transmitter is going to send the left signal to one of them and the right signal to the other and so you don't necessarily have to run speaker wire from the wireless receiving amplifier and split that you know a across the room. You can have one of those little amplifying units living right next to each surround speaker. They do need to be plugged into an electrical outlet. So uh, that is going to be the consideration. Is there an electrical outlet close enough by that that is going to work, but that is sort of the only requirement at that point. So speaker wire then runs from each individual wireless amplifier to the surround speakers, and that solves this problem. I do want to mention that each separate amplifying unit has a gain knob on it, and the transmitter has a gain knob on it. And then you still have the trim level that you set inside of the AV receiver. And there's a bit of an order of operations in how to set each of those levels. I would start by connecting the uh, amplifiers, each individual amplifier to the speaker with nothing playing. And you turn the gain up on each individual amplifier as high as you can go uh, to start with. Then sit in the seat or wherever somebody might be sitting closest to the speaker and you'll probably hear a little bit of a noise floor a little bit of a hiss coming from the speaker so you're going to turn down the gain knob 
on the amplifier itself until you don't hear that little bit of noise floor hiss anymore and you're going to leave that alone then you're going to power everything on the transmitter and the uh, av receiver still nothing playing <laughs> and you're going to turn up the gain knob on the transmitter uh basically not not as high as it'll go you're going to turn that one up until you start to hear a little bit of noise floor and then back it off a little bit and then you're going to do the trim level on the av receiver so a bit of an order of operations there but that'll usually get you the best results of not hearing any hiss or clicks or background noise or anything coming from that so that all said that's the wireless solution it costs 200 dollars these days for the model 1800 so it's not cheap as chips but it's not crazy expensive either and it really does solve this issue that said if the issue is you could run speaker wire but you just don't want to see it there is the super duper flat and self-adhesive speaker wire uh it's available from sewell as their ghost wire and they charge just over a dollar a foot for it or there's a model that is essentially identical from monoprice that's about half that price it's uh, just a little over 50 cents a foot if you get it from monoprice sewell does sell the rolls in longer lengths mm. than are available from monoprice so if you end up needing more than a 50 foot roll just for a single run then sewell can do that and monoprice doesn't have that as an option the longest roll they sell is 50 feet but probably not in the setup that you're describing you do want to make sure you get the little terminal blocks that turn that super flat speaker wire back into a regular speaker wire connection so that's about ten dollars for two pairs of those blocks which is all you need uh that that's all you need is, is the two pairs so that'll get that done and you just crimp the super flat speaker wire inside of it and then that converts it to regular speaker wire on the other end uh so that's self-adhesive uh you can paint right over it you can also plaster and paint over it to make it completely invisible so that is a good solution uh and then if you're just like i don't need self-adhesive but i would like flat speaker wire monoprice has just regular flattened speaker wire the jacket is flat so it lays nice and flat and is easy to ride along baseboards and like i say you can use like museum putty or that uh, gorilla tack uh museum putty as an option there to adhere it without leaving anything that'll mar or mark anything so those are options for actually routing speaker wire over to those surround speakers uh at a, at a lower price because it's it's cheaper to get the speaker wire but if you need the wireless solution amphony model 1800 is definitely what i'd point you to Sorry. There's Alexa, an alarm going off. Stop. I thought I turned that off <laughs> for this thing. I I I had it on my phone and everything. You saw me jump up. <laughs> yep, so there's sorry. no stopping her. There's no stopping the A lady. Once she wants to do something, it's gonna happen. I had put the timer on my phone. I got I caught the timer before it went off. I was like, ha, ah, I'm so good at this. I am the best. <laughs> <laughs> At least it was good timing. We just finished the question. All right. Uh, where are we as far as timing? Speaking of which, we got, oh, we got, got about half, half an hour left. Yeah. Mike. Mike is getting ready to build his DIY screen frame. He was going for a 92-inch diagonal screen size, but he worked out that, that the precise interior dimensions of the frame was he was going to construct ended up being 79 and a third wide by 44 and 5 eighths tall. That works inches out. Inches we're talking about. Inches, yes. yeah. That works out to the fabric uh, of the screen material being exactly 91.023 inches diagonal. He doesn't <laughs> yes. consider himself to be a particularly skilled carpenter, so he's wondering how much can the precise measurements and cuts be fudged? For example, if he were, it would happen that the interior dimensions of the frame ended up being, let's say, 79 and a quarter and by 44 and a half instead. No one's in their right mind is going to be able to tell the difference between those two things from that distance. Well, I mean, what's happening... You're going to have overshoot anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Right. Yeah, if you made it 79 and a quarter by 44 and a half instead of exactly 79 and a third, which is weird for inches, uh, by 44 and 5 eighths, then technically you no longer have a perfectly 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Uh, you, you've slightly altered the aspect ratio, which means that when you project your 16 by 9 image onto this 79 and a quarter by 44 and a half, just as an example, if we're fudging the numbers a little bit, uh, then some of the pixels are inevitably going to be uh, overshooting onto the frame of your screen. Or I, I suppose if you made sure that whatever one, whatever dimension is slightly smaller, then there'd be a tiny little gap <laughs> on the screen itself. There'd be a tiny little bit of blank space. Uh, but what you would do in this situation, what we'd pretty much do in every projector situation is we have a tiny little bit of spill that goes onto the frame 
of the uh, projection screen. Uh, and that's what you would do. So you would ever so slightly not have a perfect 16 by 9 anymore. Of course, if you're watching anything that's letterboxed or pillar boxed, that really isn't going to matter. Uh, but that is what you would be giving up. So it's a handful of pixels, uh, you know, either at the top and bottom or on the left and right uh, that you just aren't seeing because they're projecting onto the uh, frame itself. Uh, but that is a really minimal difference. So basically this comes down to if you're someone who's like, I demand pixel perfection. <laughs> I must have literally every pixel exactly perfectly squarely aligned on screen. Then you wouldn't do this because <laughs> you're not going to get and that. if you are uh, not a crazy person, if you are not that, that anal retentive, then this is okay. Now, you wouldn't want to go drastic. That's obvious, right? You wouldn't want to go to 79 inches by 23 because now you are definitely not getting anything close to a 16 by 9 ratio. But yeah, you're, we're talking about a handful of pixels are going to be on this frame of the screen instead of on the screen itself. That's what's going to happen. Right. Luke in Australia, Luke uh, gets to set up a new room as a home theater. It's pretty much a perfect tr rectangle, almost a triangle for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> it is not that. <laughs> Roughly 12 by 14 and a half by nine feet high. One of the 14 and a half feet walls uh, has a large window. He plans to make that the right side wall of the theater. The diagrams he sent put the front wall on the bottom. So it's on the left of the diagram, but that would be the right side wall. Anyways, yeah. you can, you'll see the image. If you're looking at the diagrams, then yeah, the front wall's at the bottom. So the right wall is on the left of the diagram. <laughs> the entrance to the room is a sliding door on what will be the left side wall near the front of the theater. It's a wood door, uh, three and a half feet wide, and it's, seal it's a sealed unit that slides into the cavity of the wall. So it isn't prone to rattling and it blocks off the sound quite well. Mm -hmm. The not rattling is important. I'm glad that, that, to hear about that. He yeah. already owns pretty much all the home theater equipment that he intends to use in this room with no real plans or budget to add any more at the moment. So he's mostly looking for advice about specific placement, though he does intend to add at least one pair of in-ceiling speakers to expand the system to at most. Be prepared to be underwhelmed. <laughs> uh, the walls are plasterboard and painted. The floor is carpeted, and he will install floor-to-ceiling curtains over the large window. Uh, this TV is an 83 inch C, uh, LG C1 OLED, and that's going to be mounted on the front wall with the window on the right and the sliding door on the left. So for a reminder of those of you that weren't paying attention two and a half seconds ago. <laughs> uh, he's got a Paradigm Monitor V7 towers for the front left and right with the matching center and Paradigm Atom bookshelf speakers for the surrounds. He was thinking at a pair of Paradigm in-ceiling speakers to make it a 5.1.2 setup and a subwoofer is a single SVS SB2000. He has two potential setups in mind. The decorating committee's preference would be to have their L-shaped couch pushed right back against the back wall and the left wall. That would basically leave him no space for his bookshelf surround speakers unless they were mounted way high up. So he feels like he would need to switch to in-wall surround speakers, which would he would then mount on in the side walls firing directly across uh, the back of the room and elevate the bit above seated ear level. The other setup would put the couch, uh, pull the couch away from the back wall and the left wall by about one foot or so, but that would give him just enough room to mount his back uh, bookshelf surround speakers basically in the rear two corners however if that gap is going to be there the requirement within to make use of it by in some kind some kind of shelving or cabinets so is isn't sure it'd be <laughs> worth it and like our thoughts and all of that shelving or cabinets behind the couch or above the behind the couch because if it's only uh, a foot that doesn't I make know, any that's sense that's what was mentioned i i yeah i mean <laughs> I don't know. The, the whole thing of like shoving seats right against the walls of like honestly doesn't having a foot gap feel more comfortable having a, a little bit of space I mean don't don't you want to be able to dust back there you got to have a little bit of a gap you don't have to dust um, if you can't see it yeah but um, I mean honestly it, look here's the thing if because our recommendation is definitely going to be try to get the seats away from the walls as much as you possibly can so Here's what I would argue if Two installing, <laughs> yeah, well, if installing some shelves means that, oh, it just makes sense to pull the seats a little bit farther away from the walls, then that's what I would do. I would kind of use the reverse of this. He's like, oh, do, you know, this is where I'd like to put the seats. It lets me use the speakers I already have. I'm, if I have that gap, I have to put some shelves in. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm going to put some shelves in and that means I'm going to have to pull the seats away and the decorating committee is not going to complain about it at all. So I would I would do that. I would 100% do that. Uh, you know, if it's going to be bookshelves that are standing against the walls or it's shelves that are attached to the walls or whatever it is, 
inches. They're probably going to be more than a foot deep. That's a your benefit. argument here and should be: we should decorate this back wall more. What are you talking yeah, about? Why are we going? Yeah. Why are we not going to make use of the space? We should put the bookshelf back there, That's and we right. should have access to it. So let's move sure. the whole thing forward, and then. Uh, yeah, because I mean, this is a nice 83 inch OLED. That's wonderful, but you're talking about sitting 14 feet, feet away, away from it. That's <laughs> too far. It's gonna be so, it's gonna be tiny. So it's honestly, uh, yeah, whatever uh, wants to be done on that back wall so that it forces the seats to be farther forward, I'm all for. So yeah, put some put some actual bookshelves back there with enough of a walkway to get to the bottom of the bookshelves. Then it's not going to feel weird at all that the seats are towards the middle of the room. There's nothing else in this room. What do you need all that space in the middle of the room for? Now it's just going to make perfect sense that there is space at the back of the room. And that's, I would go for that whole hog. And now it's going to be easy. It's going to be trivial to place your bookshelf speakers back there. In fact, you're going to have shelves to hold them. So wonderful. That is absolutely absolutely what I would do. Yeah. How big is this window? That's what I want to know. <laughs> like, oh, I mean, I, it's more than half of the right side. No, window. I mean, but like top to bottom. Is it like... Oh, I don't know. You know what I mean? He didn't say. Does the, shel- does the, does, would the seats go easily underneath it or is it like floor to ceiling? You know, it'd be weird to have the seats there because I, I mean, if you're going to slam it, if curtains. you're going to slam the seats against the back wall, I don't love where they are yeah. anyways. I'd put them on the other side and, uh, you know, uh, walk in towards the seats instead of right. walk in in front of the TV. Have the chaise lounge part of it under the window as yes. opposed to next to where the door is. I mean, he's got plenty of space to bring those seats forward before you get close to the door. So even if it the like if the seats are affixed, if they're not uh, uh, changeable yeah. like that to put the chaise lounge on the other side, that's okay. Uh, it, it, you could still got plenty of space to bring it forward, have a walkway and a bookshelf at the back of this room. So that yeah. all works. Uh, in the diagrams, we can see that he has three potential spots for placing a single subwoofer. He tends to choose the best of these three spots via trial and error once he's there. Any thoughts or advice on that front? Where are the three? Oh, that's what the one, two, three is. Yeah, one, okay. two, three. Yeah, basically the corners everywhere that there isn't a, a seat in the corner. I mean, look, yeah. Obviously, we have to be prepared with a single subwoofer setup, and I'm glad that you're willing to do the trial and error. You're really focusing on its performance in the main seat and whatever the other seats get. Is this wall mounted TV get. though? Is this a wall mounted TV? Yeah. Planning to well, wall then he's mount got the two more TV. spots. I don't know what he's complaining about. He can put it on between the the center and the two speakers as well. That's, Potentially, yes, yeah. yeah. Unless the plan is to have a you know a, a significantly sized TV stand down there yeah. that makes that an impossibility, which isn't out of the question. Uh, but yeah, what I would say is, if it really is just these three options, there there's nothing preventing you from trying the base sweep, playing on repeat in across the entire seating area that you have, you might discover that there really isn't that much difference in the primary seat in any of these three spots, but at least one other seat sounds better with the sub in one of these three spots, and that's the way you go. So, you know, it is trial and error. There isn't much else to do about yeah. it in this. You, you could do a subwoofer crawl, but it isn't really necessary. Uh, SB2000 is not difficult to move around, and if there's only three or even five sp- spots to try it, you don't have to do the reciprocal and put the sub in the seat and you move around. You, you can do the regular setup. So, yeah. Uh, all for that. Of course, we would say if if the time comes, you can afford a second SB2000, and an SB2000 in this room size is absolutely fine. You don't need a bigger, more output-capable sub than an SB2000 in here. You know, having them in positions one and three in the diagonally opposite corners would easily be the way to go. So when that day comes, that's what we would do. For acoustic treatments, he was thinking he'd basically line as much of the front and back walls as he can, and then he'd add some basic panels on whatever part of the left wall is available to sort of balance out the floor to ceiling curtains over the windows on the right. Well, you don't have to put anything on the other side because the curtains aren't doing crap. Uh, <laughs> for the front and back walls, he found a company in Australia called Akufelt. Akufelt, yeah, yeah. It's like acoustics and felt. Yeah. And they sell yeah. panels that are acoustic felt which I haven't really heard of, covered by wood grain slatted panels. The thickest options are less than two inches deep. Mm-hmm. The aesthetics would work, but would those panels be suitable for a home theater? What no. we recommend? And what do we <laughs> think about this idea for the layout of the acoustic panels in this room? Um, well, better, uh, more is always better. So I'm never going to say you, that you haven't chosen okay. enough. Do I think these particular panels make sense? I don't. I think these are for um, these are not really made for uh, 
home theater no. type they'll, they'll of They'll have thing. some impact on vocals. You know, they're meant for like an office type of location where all you're really worried about is speech I feel like intelligibility. they're be very, very expensive too. They look very, yeah. very expensive. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the, if you just look up acoustic treatments in Australia, a lot of them are very overpriced and not very thick and very often have this sort of wood look to them. So I can see how he came by that. It isn't what I would recommend for your home theater. I agree with you. It makes sense to treat your front and back walls. I think that's really all you need to do. Um, it's, it's not really going to make any difference whether you treat that left wall. There isn't a great way to treat the right wall. The whole room is carpeted. So thankfully, you're not going to have right. crazy reverberation times to begin with, at least in the Volker range. So I do think make sense to treat the front and back wall now look if you go with our plan your whole back wall is basically going to be a bunch of bookcases anyway so anywhere that you aren't having knickknacks or if you're filling part of the back of the bookshelves themselves you can fill in portions of the back of the bookshelves with insulation yourself just put some fabric over it it's going to look nice and that's going to act as acoustic treatment on the back go as thick as you reasonably can but you know live in the real world nothing wrong with that uh always go as thick as you can so down in australia there is cmf acoustics uh, that's the place we normally point you to where they have normal made out of insulation panels. They go as thick as at least three inches. So it's not, you know, crazy base traffic, but that's perfectly reasonable. You can get at least, uh, you know, three inch thick panels, which is better than most of the other options in Australia. Uh, looking at them in Australian dollars where they're like $175 for those panels seems a bit high, but in Australian dollars, that's not really that crazy for, uh, for panels, um, you know, versus what you can get elsewhere. So CMF Acoustics is where I was point you. They can get regular fabric panels or they do printed panels there at cmf yeah, acoustics as well yeah. so if this is about doing decoration on the front wall i would maybe invest in some printed panels you know that are going behind your front left and right towers and that would make a lot of sense and try to get them as thick as you can two inches is okay three inches would be better if you can manage it 75 millimeters of course is how they they list that <laughs> hmm. i'm just looking at the panels yeah they look pretty good they're completely reasonable yeah no. For, uh, after school oh he's done John being a headphone fan and a balanced headphone fan in particular John has invested in several headphone amplifiers one of his favorite is his name I won't say Audio <laughs> Magnius Magnius yes from S-C-H-I-I-T shit audio Balanced headphone preamp and amplifier via its balanced output, it can put out a whopping 6 watts into 16 ohm headphones and over 500 milliwatts into difficult to drive 600 ohm headphones. Yeah, that's all, ridiculous. <laughs> all with a very high signal to noise ratio and exceedingly low distortion. So he was going to get a second Magnus for a second PC setup, but he discovered the model has been discontinued. <gasps> In this place is the new Midgard Halo model. My lord, I hate this place. It's $20 more expensive, uh, and the listed specs on the website aren't quite as detailed. From what's listed, does the Midgard Halo appear to be the same, better, or worse than his beloved Magnus model? I, I Okay, I think that this company sells very good products. Mm -hmm. All the naming conventions makes me angry. From a, <laughs> just, a, just from a standpoint of, I don't okay. want... I mean, at least they picked a theme and they stuck with they it. And did. it isn't just a, it isn't just a string of random letters but and numbers. Let's so just that. be honest here. How do you have a discussion about this stuff with people who aren't in who aren't in the know about it, who have never uh -huh. seen it before? Because every like, how do you talk about your equipment and not get like either blank stares or people <laughs> covering their children's ears or mm. you looking like a complete a hole as your you know, right. oh my Thor's hammer Midgard <laughs> amplifier is the best. What? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. What? Are, what are you talking about? So I, that's what I don't like about it. But that being said, I think you know everything I've read about these products, everything I've seen about these products has all been very good and very yeah. positive. And I'm not against the products themselves. I just think you already look enough like an absolute nerd when you talk about <laughs> audio. Why make it so that there's no way anybody's going to ever take you seriously about this stuff uh, when you when, when, by the naming conventions of some stupid company? So go on. I don't have a problem with calling a headphone amplifier Midgard. That doesn't seem too bad no. to me. But anyway, uh, You're so Canadian. Look, what do you know? 
there there are some some slight differences here. These two things are far more similar than different. Uh, technically, the Midgard Halo, even though it's newer and ever slightly more expensive, uh, uh, at, at its absolute extremes, uh, and particularly at the lowest impedance headphones and the highest impedance headphones, not so much in the normal range, middle impedance range of headphones where the figures are essentially identical, but at the lowest uh, impedance and at the highest impedance, the new Midgard Halo uh, doesn't output quite as high a wattage as uh, the old, uh, what was the other one called? Whatever, the one you already have, I'm forgetting the name of it. Um, but yeah, uh, it is a slight uh, a downgrade there, you might say. Uh, but honestly, nothing to worry about. You are never putting out five and a half or six watts into a pair of headphones that would be utterly ridiculous unless they're electrostatics i suppose but then they actually need probably a bit more than that so that's not what this is about uh you know 600 own headphones are not going to need more than 200 milliwatts of power or if they do there's been a terrible design choice <laughs> so you've got well more than you could ever possibly need for anything and the rest of it is uh basically a wash the one key difference here is that the Magnus model that you used to have could be run in single-ended mode versus the new Midgard, which is really a balanced headphone amplifier. But that's what you wanted to do anyway, so it's absolutely going to be fine if you get the, the Midgard and use that instead. I can't imagine you'll notice any difference on your balanced headphones. Yep. Go ahead and just announce in the midst of a group of people that you don't know that just start listing off the gear that you own and see what see what looks you get stan mcintosh announced a new standalone standalone graphic equalizer their mq 112 environmental equalizer that's that, called that is just the name that is called that is an ac that's what it, that's what an ac <laughs> and heating unit is it's an environmental <laughs> equalizer mm. mcintosh is dumb it sells for three grand which is <laughs> About the same price as the, uh, like a small AC unit. So there it's you go. A it's a stereo graphic E2. This is not multi-channel. This oh, of course not. This stereo, is Macintosh. That would be right. ridiculous. Yeah. It provides it's knobs to adjust uh, plus or minus 12 dB at fixed frequencies of you know, uh, knobs to adjust. Uh, so yes. up, up and down 12 dB uh, from zero. So a 24, I guess that's technically a 25. 20, yeah, 24 decibel range. Yeah. yeah. Uh, of 2550, these are the frequencies 25 hertz, 50, 100, 200, 400, 11, uh, 1000, 3000, and 10,000 hertz. There's also yeah, so a, we, were, we, were, we were going in octave steps there until for some reason in the mid range and treble, they're just like, nope, giant leaps. Giant leaps. <laughs> There's also bass and treble tone controls. Price point aside, is there really any use case for tr traditional graphic EQ anymore? I can't say no hard enough. Uh, there, so, okay, you could live in a room and in a space where mm -hmm. you have a problem at one of these frequencies and this thing could accidentally fix it. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure, I, yeah. I, I mean, it, the use case, like, is so very specific. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, it's like when we, we talk about subwoofer, uh, integrated in EQs where they have their own parametric EQ that's involved yeah. and you can do something with it and you're like, just let your room correction do it because your room correction does a much better job <laughs> and it's much more flexible and it has, you know, everything else. Uh, whereas you're like, okay, but if I had a really bad problem at one frequency, this could tame oh, it okay. down, you know, yeah. and then do it, you know, you know, that very specific situation where not yeah. only do you know, not only do you have the problem, but you know you have the problem and you know mm -hmm. the extent of the problem. You've gone through all the measurements and everything else in order to know exactly what you want to do. And then this thing, you're like, okay, well, I specifically have a problem at these specific frequencies. This thing not only has the right frequencies and the right mm. decibel range, but also the right cue, right? Because it's got a, yeah. it, it, it's 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 not just adjusting that one frequency. There's a there's a it, it, it adjusts the frequencies around it. Now, how does it? How many frequencies? I don't know. It does something, but usually you can adjust the cue with a with a 
a, a parametric EQ. Yes. You can't do that here. You're just like, whatever yeah, Macintosh are- decided I needed is what I needed, which if you're an Apple fan, you're already kind of used to that. But if you're somebody who really cares about audio, this is, you just send me the $3,000 and I will tell you mm. that your system sounds better. And that it will be doing the exact same thing. Yeah, you're playing with low statistical odds here with this yeah. one. But also, this product is unforgivable because this is coming from Macintosh and yet the front panel color is green. What is it's going on blue. here? What is Why actually would it not going be on Macintosh in this thing? Blue? Why? And it's, I mean, it's a graphic it's EQ green. where you can't even see the graphics. You can't see the lines well, go I mean, up. I'm, I'm sure the little lines do go up and down on that display, but it's so short that you don't get to see it's those not, lines jumping and pumping no. all over the place. That was the point of the graphic EQ yes. was to be a light show, not to actually do anything to your audio. No. It was to be a light show, and this doesn't have a big enough screen to be a light show. This is an unforgivable product. There is nothing I want. I mean, you're you're absolutely right. The whole point of the graphic EQ is the graphics. Like that yes. is the idea. That is seeing the things jump up and down. Don't you remember right. back in when when before? you know, Spotify and even Napster and all that stuff, you would get those, 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 like those players for your computer. And what were you looking for? You were looking for the one that did one of two things. Either it did the, the music, uh, uh, graphic thing where like the, mm-hmm. the the graphics would change based on the music and the beat and everything else. And it would pulsate and everything. And you would, maybe becoming somewhat intoxicated with some substance that would make that a very entertaining thing to watch. Or you would get the graphic equalizer and the graphic equalizer had to just jump around like crazy. This doesn't do, there is nothing here that is worth $3,000. I I just, I can't see Macintosh people being a fan of this because it's the wrong damn color. What the heck are they doing? This thing should be three units high, not one. It's, oh, of course. It's, and, not, I mean, it's not nearly big enough. That's why they called it environmental for the green color, but that's just a weird choice. That's, weird choice, yeah. Macintosh. All right. How much time we got? Go one more. Michael. Yes. In Michael's new house, he'd be putting up a 75-inch TCL 6 Series TV in the living room. This is a more of a casual setup since we'll have an enclosed home theater for any series viewing now. Uh, so this is basically a TV you're never going to turn on except for when you're like cooking or well. But yeah, you might have it on, you know, game is on, you have the sports on in the background, news, whatever, that type of thing, yeah. He was thinking he'd just add a Sonos soundbar since he still wants an improvement over the TV's built-in speakers, but then it occurred to him he has an extra Ascend Acoustic CTM 340SE center speaker on hand that he won't be using in his theater. So is there a way to hook that up directly to his TCL TV for some better quality? But mono sound that they absolutely 100% do not want to add any stereo or AV receiver in the living room. So is there some sort of compact mono amplifier that you could hide behind the TV and just take an aud- the audio output from the TV with the TV still controlling the volume and let him use that spare center speaker for mono sound so first and foremost the good news is the tcl 6 series tvs i don't know the exact model but we know it was a 6 series so there was only a a short number they all do have it's a 3.5 millimeter (laughs) analog audio output but so you will uh in the what i'm going to recommend need a stereo 3.5 millimeter to regular red and white rca cable uh adapter but that's super cheap and you can get from amazon or mono price no problem uh you will need that much but it has that stereo analog audio output it can be controlled by the tv itself so at least we have a signal we can get out of this tv to make this happen now what i would recommend is of course that signal is going to be coming out as stereo analog uh and i would recommend getting a proper stereo analog to mono analog little converter now you can get that for 22 bucks on amazon it's a tiny little device so this is not taking up any space and this just takes the red and white stereo inputs and converts them to it actually gives you two mono outputs is is what comes out of there but that's perfectly fine they're both mono so that's going to be all right that that properly does it without the chance of the signal now clipping before it goes into the amplifier because if you just used a y cable in reverse uh because you have two uh stereo analog signals just being like literally combined into a single single cable that can lead to the sig- uh, signal clipping sometimes so this is a proper way of converting it and it's only 22 bucks and it's tiny so that's the sc21 uh stereo analog to mono converter now i would recommend uh one of mono prices um amplifiers for this uh, uh application just because it's super duper thin 
Uh, it's easy to leave powered on all the time, and it comes with hardware to attach it to the back of a TV. <laughs> so it's like, it's got all the things you were asking for. Uh, now, this is set up as a stereo amplifier, as you would expect, but you can bridge it. Uh, so... Whether you do that or not isn't gonna really. It's not really necessary. You could, of course, just take the mono output uh, from the uh, from the uh, little adapter that I recommended there, and uh, you can just plug that into, say, the left input on the back of the mono price amplifier, and then just connect the speaker to the left. That's totally gonna work. Uh, but you do have the option of bridging this amplifier as well. Uh, there is a little pot on the back of it to set the gain for this amplifier, uh, but you're still gonna be uh, adjusting the volume up and down via the TV. Uh, connection itself. So it's $140 for the mono price. That is, of course, more expensive than getting, say, uh, one of the Fosse uh, stereo amplifiers that we talk about all the time. But that doesn't come with the hardware to attach it to the back of your TV. Mm. Um, and and uh, it's easier to put, uh, accidentally uh, knock the volume adjustment on that little Fosse amplifier. So if you're okay with the price, it's just it comes with the bracket to attach it and everything. It's 140 bucks, so it's not crazy breaking the price. So yeah, we'll have the links to uh, mono prices, very slim class SD amplifier there with the hardware that comes with it and the uh, stereo analog to mono converter for 22 bucks over at Amazon. All right. Who do we have left? Yeah. So on our list, we have Nick and Infinite Gary and Kiran. All right. Uh, if you want to get your question answered on this podcast, all you have to do is ask us by emailing us at question at avrant.com. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank Tyler for going to avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and sending us a PayPal donation, as well as our 136 patrons over at patreon.com. That is for sure, Tyler. Thank you very much for that PayPal donation. We appreciate your financial support that you gave us that way. And patreon.com slash podcast is the place to go to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation that you don't have to think about and do individually every month. So big thanks to our 136 patrons over there. So I want to thank Chris for giving me permission to use his photos on AV Gadgets, as well as, yeah, notes, thanks, of, Chris. Yeah, as, well as notes of gratitude for, uh, for keeping the podcast going from Dan, Chris, Mike, Luke, Stan, Greg, Julian, Michael, and Ilongo. Thank you for thanking us. I'll say the names one more time. Dan, Chris, Mike, Luke, Stan, Greg, Julian, Michael, and Elango. Thank you all very much for your notes of gratitude and encouragement. We definitely do appreciate them these days. And a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.